So, my dear Mohammed, do you know that we have a training on socio-economic sustainability for many protected areas? Oh, really? It's a good news. What is about, Ali? Oh, it is very interesting. It will be in Turkey and in the beautiful city of Akyaka, in Genova, in what? Gekova. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in Gokova, with a beautiful trainer and expert, and also beautiful participant from Lebanon, Tunisia, Libya, Morocco, Turkey. Um, I forget someone. Egypt. No, I don't think so. Egypt. Yeah, yeah, Egypt, of course. And it was organized by Sparak and Algeria. We forgot Algeria, you know. Yes. It will be like very yes. amazing. It is for five days mm -hmm. and many things and many tools. And it was, it, it will be very fruitful and very beautiful. You know why? Yeah. Because it is not about only presentation and all this kind of thing. It will be like something interesting. You will move about like break Give and... Give us more details, Ali. Yeah, we will talk about, let's say, natural capital, social capital. We run a lot of management effectiveness. Yeah, and we have a lot beautiful trainer, let's say, from America, from Tunisia, from Spain, from England. So they will teach us and they will give us a lot of things and we'll be so generous. So now today we'll have a recapitulative of the first two days. That's the point here. Mm -hmm. So, today, dear friend, good morning. So, we are team one, and uh, let me present, oh, team two, sorry, team two. So, it is like the effect of the last night, so. <laughs> so, and let me, see, let me say that it's not easy to organize everything in one day. So, help me, it's about Ubuntu, so we help each other. So. Uh, my team too, it's like represented by, first of all, my colleague from Egypt, Mohammed, my other colleague from Libya, Mohammed. I have two colleagues from Turkey, from the Ministry of Agriculture. Unfortunately, they are not here today. And we have a colleague, uh, Fatima, from Egypt. Um, she's a little bit tired, so we can excuse her. It's okay. So we'll do everything to be perfect. And also I have my colleague from Lebanon here, our friend Samer. So today... As you can see, like, it's beautiful, no? I can say, let me start by the beautiful, like, sentence of my colleague and our dear Ate from Sparag. Alone, you go faster, but together you go further. That is all about this. So today, to go directly to the point, I will let now my colleague Mohammed to talk about what is happening about social capital. So he will try to do like a recapitulative, a visual capitulative for all of you. Okay? So, dear Muhammad, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as you know, uh, we talked... <laughs> we talked the two last days about the natural capital. The natural capital, as you know, provide us with many uh, services. Uh, who can uh, uh, remind me what about the uh, three types of, main three types of uh, uh, ecosystem services? Anyone to hear me? Professional, Professional yes. Regulating. Regulating. Cultural. And cultural. cultural. Uh, this type of service can be provided us with uh, the main ecosystem services. Ecosystem, services. ecosystem good and services. Good and services. Okay. Uh, these services is under many br pressure. Uh, uh, this, this service under no pressure. This pressure can be affected directly on the uh, human benefits. Human benefits, direct or indirectly. Uh, how can we manage uh, this pressure to uh, to continue uh, the human can be benefit from uh, this uh, service. We have to do four approaches. One of them, designing, 
the MBA, MBAs, to enhance the livelihood of local community. Of local communities. Mapping impacts from livelihood on the natural resources. Then removing ah, title on removing barrier, removing barrier to access for local community to benefit from the uh, natural capital and supporting livelihood. and enhancement. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Mm. In fact, I don't know. The, the idea is like, as my colleague Muhammad say, that the idea is when you have natural capital, you have pressure on it. And when you have this pressure, so your, your, your job is to valorize the values of this natural capital. So they can provide ecosystem. And you have pressure on it, so you have to defend yourself. And when you have ecosystems, services, as we talk, like it's about, uh, let's say, uh, recreation, swimming, all this kind of thing. So it will give us also benefit. The benefit will go with more like, for like example, clean water, family life, everything else. It. So here I have like a, so I, we have like many change of laptops, so sorry. So I don't understand what is happening. <laughs> you go to train. Yeah, the image too. Thank you. Yeah, you are great. Perfect. Our training. So I don't know what is this kind of thing. But so beautiful. It's animated. Yeah. So. <laughs> Oops. Ah, perfect. This kind of ecosystem services and if you want uh, function and benefit that you can find in any MPA, I think we are all like related with this. I will not go into detail, we don't have a lot of time, we, we need like to take some information from our trainer. So just, uh, we can share it with you later. And uh, our dear uh, Patty, we can go to the next uh, image please, thank you. You are working with us now, it's about Ombutu, perfect. So just here I will give you an example of a many protected area in the south of Lebanon. As you all know now, you should like remember Tirkost Nature Reserve. And what we did, we did a socio-economic with the help of the Sparak, of course, that's supporting us a lot to do this kind of study. And I will show you just this number, look at this number, the benefits. It's like 3.5 million. So if we did this kind of activities, you know, and if you go to other image, our dear colleague, Patty, thank you. Look also, coastal protection, and we see here fisheries. You see here, when you have an MPA, how it is beautiful, and open fishing, look what is happening. And if you have an MPA, look at the number also. And if you can go, my dear Patty, thank you. Prepare yourself, it will be a pop quiz at the end, as usual. So, so focus, please. <laughs> and here I want to show you just a little bit about some important coastal ecosystem in our Mediterranean. And here I want to open like two, two beautiful sentences to say about climate change. You know here, for example, we have Simodosia Nodosa. In the Mediterranean you have Posidonia. It's, you know, Le Poumon de la Méditerranée. It's mean like... You will translate it later. Our translator will help us. Thank you. And we have Cystosera and we have Vermited Reef. Look at all these benefits. You see? And if you protect, that's the point. You protect, you monitor, and you valorize. And you will, hear, you will have ecosystem services. And you have benefit from this. This is so important. Benefit for the MPA and also for the government. That is also so critical. 
Uh, if we can go also. Yeah, we continue just to show you some number about, for example, here. Oh, it's not so clear. I don't know why, but it's okay. Water and food, for example, look at the numbers. And here we have, yeah, people's well-being, tourist attraction, and source of livelihood. So if we have a total of all this, we have around like 19 to 80 million dollars it give us from an MPA, including project, all this kind of thing. Okay, so just keep in mind that social capital and natural capital is so important. And the next day, we'll see what is also important. So, and now I will leave my colleague Samuel for one minute. He has something so interesting from a caricaturist, caricaturist, what is it? Yeah, something like this, yeah, a point of view, so. Remember, there is a pop quiz, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's too far. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, open the slide. Okay. okay. Uh, you can, uh, enter from enter? Enter. Enter, okay. Uh, good morning. The basic of uh, socioeconomic empowerment uh, should be based on some of this idea. Individual difference in perception. I will give you an example how stakeholder perceive a Lesipsian fish. It's an example. Uh, it can be copy paste for any other examples. Next, please. For example, when a Lesipsian fish come from uh, Red Sea to a Medi Mediterranean Sea, uh, okay. Uh, for a university professors, what does, that, does it mean? Yes. I will make a new first record and a new publication. This is the reception fish for a university professor. Other stakeholder. This is Ali for an ecologist. <laughs> Here we can say what, what does it mean for him? Oh no, we should stop this bio biological pollution. Next, please. For a traditional fisherman. Okay. Hope, hope to get a good price. For him, what is interested for him is a good price for this kind of fish. Next, please. For a uh, sport fisherman, a new species, new fishing trips, and a new fun. Next, please. For a diver, a diving instructor, a new species, new diving trips, new money. For a, for a chef, it's a new species, a new recipe, more clients. Next, please. For a Lebanese, for a Lebanese lady, I should have the same dress color. <laughs> so, next, please. <laughs> so, uh, next, please. Uh, <laughs> each person see from its benefits. So, speak to people according to their minds. We should speak to people according to their minds. Thank you, team two. So we have a small video here, time to pop quiz. And we have a small video we saw yesterday, before I will uh, say because someone, so first of all, all the phone on the table, a hand up, <laughs> so no cheating, please. The video. It is what we We should like uh, close this, please. <laughs> the video. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So we saw a lot of jellyfish. Who is the person who tell me the Italic, the let's say the Latin name of the species? Scientific. So we have. We give like some something, so fishers and uh, others who okay, not allowed. Not allowed. <laughs> uh, wait, I know because you have been with me. And I also collected these species and put it on a uh, so, c'est quoi un so en anglais? A, yeah, a packet. So if you are like so interested and you are like, uh, let's say, take and enjoy the field, you will know it. We, we can, and we play with it. Who can tell us first the jar? Go for it. Uh, 
the genus. Uh, okay, Aurelia. The other one. Come on. Come on. Aurelia what? It will not be bad redeem. Come on. Anyone? <laughs> so, it will be, it is Aurelia Orita. Please remember, it's important because in the future, this kind of proliferation is not like usual for us. It's a special event. This is why I did this, focus, this pop quiz on it. So, I think I will let the trainer choose the winner because uh, <laughs> we only have much. So, he said Aurelia, and uh, I think, so, it's much. So you have the floor, yeah. <laughs> and this is from Akiaka also. So you deserve it. <laughs> yeah, not so much because you didn't say Orita. So, <laughs> so, and yeah, at the end, thank you, Sparak. Thank you, trainer. Thank you for everything for the great familiar, very fruitful, uh, uh, let's say, training. And that's it for team two. Thank you. <laughs>
but Aisha was the first person in deeply involved with it to point out the diff some of the difficulties they have. It's a difficult balancing act, and we're all experimenting with it. Next one. So um, it is the fundamental, this, this uh, idea of good governance uh, is becoming globally so important. I'm sure a lot of you are from governments and you'll, be, uh, you'll know how equity and um, uh, the components of good governance are really becoming the foundation of all conservation and environmental management now. Uh, and it's enshrined in a variety of global agreements that all our countries are signed up to. Uh, key things are things like transparency, uh, accountability. These are all words that you're very familiar with now, but actually making them have meaning in an MPA situation uh, is not necessarily so easy. Okay. And uh, we, what we want to do today is to look at the various arrangements that can be made to actually uh, facilitate this and make our, the setup, the management and governance setup of the MPA more inclusive to actually bring in uh, how the, these perceptions that we've talked about of the different stakeholders and find a way to agree over them. Uh, if the biologist wants to um, uh, create a new species, that's an important role. Uh, but equally, if somebody's making a lively, uh, their livelihood out of it and if the restaurants are dependent on the MPA, that's also a very valid point of view. Okay. So I think many of you will be familiar now with this whole scale that there is um, of governance from the government point of view, the rather more in the European part of the world and North Africa, the government-based management, um, through to community-based management, which is the other end of the scale, where the local communities themselves uh, manage their marine resources. And, and that's probably strongest in the Pacific. Uh, probably many of you not necessarily have been to the Pacific, but there, uh, traditional people on the islands, they have very strong sense of rights over certain areas, and they've had long, for decades, centuries, centuries, have managed their own resources in their own way in certain areas. So between these two, two opposite ends, if you like, of the scale of government, there are all huge variety of uh, governance arrangements where you have <coughs> a government-based uh, legal authority for, for management uh, with varying degrees of participation by local communities and other sectors. And we're going to be talking about, uh, yes, thanks, going to be talking about these. So um, we've talked a lot about fisheries here. So that's one example where there can be co-management arrangements set up between a uh, fisheries organization and a government organization. Uh, and that's, in fact, where the, for, in the marine environment, in fact, the concept of co-management really started. Some of the very earliest work was done in the Philippines on co-management back in the 1980s, where they set up very small MPAs uh, with local government and local communities and formalized this in various arrangements. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's, it's complex. And uh, as we've seen, we've got tourism, we've got all sorts of other impacts uh, on an MPA. And those sectors and stakeholders involved in those other activities need to be involved um, as well. And it was rather good starting with our first visible uh, view of it with the field trip yesterday at Gokova, where we have a co-management arrangement between the NGO, AKD, and the government. And we learned a lot about how that co-management arrangement is set up and the benefits that that can bring, how the NGO can bring benefits to the area, uh, can help with the protection of the natural capital, but can help to also uh, realize some of the um, uh, social capital through its work, for example, with the fishermen. The other nice example was the Lebanon one with the um, women's uh, cooperatives that we heard, heard about yesterday. Okay, next one. 
Uh, and then the other thing we heard about yesterday, it's really important to think about, is the arrangements between government ministries and government agencies. Again, as we saw from uh, some of the country presentations in the cafe yesterday, different ministries in different countries have the legal mandate for setting up and managing protected areas. In some countries, there may be a national protected area agency with all the protected areas managed under it, which may come under the Ministry of Environment. In other ones, the Ministry of Fish Fisheries is responsible for MPAs. In some, there are other, um, other ministries that, that have the legal basis for, for and the legislation uh, is, uh, allows for the protect, establishment of protected areas. And as we also know with governments, ministries change. Uh, you get a new government comes in and the ministries are changed. So there's fluctuations there. So what's also now being realised is that there needs to be some kind of collaborative mechanism between the different government agencies that have a role in the management of a protected area. Whatever the agency's name, it might be the Ministry of Fisheries one year and the Ministry of Maritime Affairs another year. But it still will have the responsibility for marine activities. And similarly, the Ministry of Environment, which name may change, that will always have some aspect. And there will also be ministries responsible for uh, the cultural well-being, uh, local communities in our government. We keep changing. We have a Ministry of Local Government and then it disappears and then it comes back. Um, so, but if you have a system and... Um, I think it was Morocco and Tunisia now have their <coughs> national councils for uh, protected air <coughs> or setting up their national councils. So we want to look in more detail at that today. Okay. Um, and all this really is, uh, we need to be thinking about what this means in co-management. And this is a definition that we've just put up for today. Um, I think Anne, it's Anne came up with the wording. Um, so it basically shows you how it's all encompassing. If you look in the literature, there are many examples of, co of definitions of co-management. The precise definition isn't important. The key thing is that we understand that the reason we're setting up this kind of approach is to get this balance, balance of power, making sure that incentives are there to encourage all the stakeholders, whatever their perception of the site is, of the MPA is, uh, making sure that all the interests are addressed. <coughs> and also importantly, perhaps we haven't talked about so much, is the role that different stakeholders can provide in producing the knowledge and information about the site. We've talked a bit about the problem of not having data and when we say that, we're often referring to scientific data. Uh, but actually, the knowledge about the site is possibly more important. And I think we got a flavour of that talking to the fishermen uh, at the, the co Fishers co Cooperative yesterday. Okay. So, again, there are many beautiful diagrams and graphics uh, emphasising the importance of collaborative approach uh, in many sectors. It's not just conservation. This approach is becoming increasingly important. And I think one of the reasons, of course, is that the, we're now realizing how key the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is these days in all aspects of our lives. That's fully being recognized. Um, and the Convention on Biological Diversity now formally recognizes the participatory approach as being the way that it recommends all countries to go about <coughs> establishing their protected areas. Next one. So we're now going to go on to the first exercise of the day. Um, well for that, there's no worksheet. We're going to just use a, a clean um, flip chart page. And with uh, all together, uh, we want you just, it's a quick exercise, this. We want you to write down uh, the authority under which the MPA is managed. So you're all working on a real MPA. So the, the, the individuals who are involved with that MPA 
will know which ministry, uh, etc. Think about the, then also think about the other government authorities that will be involved or that are involved in the MPA. And perhaps also think of the ones that should be involved, but maybe at the moment haven't really started to play a role. So do this, this is a quick exercise, but think broadly about other government agencies. Then if you could just list the um, management structure that you have. Do you have a management committee that meets with all these um, groups involved? And then is it the MPA manager? What's, what's the structure of management? Often if you've got a management plan, it will be in that. But if you haven't got a management plan yet, it's an absolute key step to be thinking about that. Um, who does the day-to-day -day management? Now we're getting lower, but uh, I always hate saying lower because these are the important people. These are the people who really matter. Who is doing the day-to-day -day management? Are they government-paid staff or are they, uh, like yesterday, we saw the uh, patrols are being done by AKD uh, officers uh, but who don't have legal authority but have a system they can call the Coast Guard in. So it can be complicated or you may have a more simple arrangement. And then uh, remembering the stakeholders that you identified on the previous days, day one and day two. Uh, day two, we did stakeholder analysis, didn't we? Um, remembering the, that list of stakeholders, what roles do they play? But this is just a quick list, okay? So just list it. You don't have to write detailed words on the FIP chart. Uh, so the purpose for doing this is that we want to know where you are at this point in time with the governance structure and the management structure of the MPA. It's the first step of getting an understanding of the MPA. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, we'll do 30 minutes on that and then we come back and uh, for the, this morning we've got three exercises and three quick presentations before each exercise, just so you know the plan. Um, now, what we're going to do in this section is talk a bit more in detail about um, stakeholders and their perceptions and how to involve them. We had that perfect introduction by Samia this morning, um, but we'll get, we need to look in a bit more detail about this. Uh, so, um, just going back to our defini definition of um, co-management, uh, uh, we really need to be looking today at this idea of who is responsible for what and the functions of the different stakeholder groups in an MPA and how you can involve them and that's what the, exercise, the next exercise will be about. Uh, and, of course, a lot of this issue about perceptions of uh, how people feel about the marine environment is to do with uh, whether they feel they can use it. Is it an open access system? You can just go into the sea and fish anywhere at any time, or you can go and dive and snorkel there at any time. Uh, or are you limited in some way? Uh, I mentioned briefly the Pacific Islands earlier on. They have a very, for centuries, have had a system where they have rights to certain areas. Different um, peoples have different rights to certain areas. And we've heard of that quite a lot uh, through the movements for indigenous people in many countries. The recognition, uh, particularly on land, it's much clearer on land because you can see boundaries. Uh, at the sea, it is much more complex but the same situations apply. People feel they own particular areas of the sea. But how the, the decisions are made about that can be really difficult at the moment. And um, if we think of it from the point of view of nations also, uh, you know, think of the law of the sea, that was the first attempt to try and sort of think about ownership of the oceans. because. In many ways, the oceans, they're big, they're open, there are no boundaries, and for many people and nations, they've just been open access, as we call it. You go out and you can go and fish. But that's really changing now, and we want to think a bit more about that. So just before we do a bit more of the sort of thought process on it, let's just see if who 
would like to say something about how decisions about access Fisheries is the easy one to think about because that's so, so important and has been thought about so much. In, in your country, what is the arrangement for people being able to access certain areas? Is it all open access? Who makes the decision? Would somebody like to open the discussion? Uh, we're talking on the MPA or in general? Just in general. We're talking in general in now. General, we'll it's an open for anyone can go and fish. Uh, sometimes they need a small uh, paper from Ministry of Agriculture to, to go fishing, but uh, one person do this. Also, to have a boat and to go fishing, you need some paper, but no one uh, uh, do this. Some of fishermen take, uh, get some paper because they need this paper. Uh, uh, if uh, the Ministry of uh, Agriculture want to give fishermen some help, so they need to have this uh, legal paper. So they are they registered for to get some help from Ministry of Agriculture. But in general, it's an, it's open. Yes. Yeah, so so that's a very common practice in Europe. I think is it in the Mediterranean. Fishermen are licensed, you, you pay something and you're allowed to use your boat and you may get certain benefits nationally. But it doesn't tell you where you can and can't fish. It's open access. Yes. Would you, yeah. what, do you want to add something, yeah, Ali? Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, just uh, something to say. Uh, because uh, the question, as I understand, is um, if there is like a zone that fishing can, fisher can go and fishing, no? That's the point. Well, well, that's what I'm asking. Do you have, we, we've, we're, we will be talking about MPAs, but yeah. in some places there may be another zoning plan or arrangement where people can only fish in certain areas and who made the, those decisions? Was it the community? Yeah. Do they feel they own an area they can fish in? Yeah. Or is it a government? Uh, yeah, so a very complicated uh, question because in general, in MPA, we, are, uh, we have this problem of patroning, this kind of thing, this one. And, and second, well, uh, do not take zone it. Until, yeah, we're, uh, we're talking in general, in general outside in general. the MPA. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 no, no, in Lebanon it's open, oh, as you said, open, so yeah. no. Yeah. Uh, no any, any other country? Are we all from open access arrangements? We, we haven't, I've realized we haven't heard much about Algeria, and I know we have. Uh, could you explain your fisheries uh, access? Okay, fisheries justement, donc, bonjour tout le monde. Donc, pour l'Algérie, donc l'autorité qui, qui, qui peut délivrer des autorisations de pêche, c'est bien la direction de, de la pêche à l'échelle locale. Donc, nous avons des, des wilayas. Donc, la wilaya, il, est il a un, un directeur. Le directeur, c'est le représentant d'un ministre de, de la pêche, donc il délivre des autorisations. Et puis, nous avons une, une, pêche, une pêche artisanale beaucoup plus, et nous avons une, une, une pêche de, de plaisance. Donc, même les, les, les particuliers peuvent, peuvent y accéder euh, en, avec une autorisation euh, en possédant un, une petite embarcation de 4,80 mètres, 5 mètres, 6 mètres. Donc, il peut euh, faire une plaisance dont il a une quantité de, une quantité de, 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 de poissons qu'il peut pêcher et, et à ne pas dépasser. En ce qui concerne tout ce qui est taille marchande, etc., donc il y a les gardes-côtes, c'est une police maritime qui, 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 qui est au niveau de, de, des ports, de, 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 de ports d'attache, là où il, il contrôle la taille marchande de, 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 chaque, de chaque espèce. Et, et il y a également le... le, il y a également le comment dirais-je de, des particuliers qui peuvent euh, pêcher à, à l'hameçon, etc. Ça, c'est permis. Il y a le, toute activité de, de, de chasse. Il est également réglementé. Donc, il y a le, le, les gardes-côtes qui délivrent des autorisations de, de, de chasse de, à des périodes bien définies. En ce qui concerne l'air marine protégée, c'est une air marine protégée. Euh, le cas, je vous parle du parc de, national de Taza, qui est un parc terrestre euh, dont l'extension en parc maritime sur une façade de 9 km, avec une superficie de 9603 euh, hectares. Donc il y a un zoning euh, concerté avec les pêcheurs. Donc, euh, il n'accède pas à la zone intégrale où euh, il n'y a que les activités de, de recherche qui sont permises. 
autre, autre, autre chose, il n'est pas permis. Donc il y a trois zones, la zone tampon, la zone intégrale et la zone périphérique. La zone périphérique, donc tous les pêcheurs, généralement je vous dis, c'est des pêcheurs de la pêche artisanale, donc ils font le, le, leur pêche, ils sont obligés de, de se rabattre vers le, 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 le port de pêche. Je vous okay. remercie. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great. So that is interesting there because not only the, the MPA system, which we're going to focus on in a moment, uh, but uh, that was a useful reminder of the different types of regulations for fisheries. And this thing about the size of the boats in some countries, uh, we have that in England, the smaller boats have priority access, well, have access rights to the inshore. It's done on the distance from, from the shore. They have access to that. And the larger boats only have access to the waters further offshore. So one more. Sinon, en Tunisie, il y a deux types de permis de pêche. Le permis de pêche côtier, côtière et la pêche euh, hauturier. Donc, le, le, eux qui se bénéficient d'un permis de pêche euh, hauturier n'ont pas le droit de pêcher au-delà d'une profondeur bien déterminée. Mais il y a aussi une exception pour euh, les bateaux de pêche euh, au nord de la Tunisie parce que, parce que l'autorité, le, le, le ministère de l'Agriculture euh, a mis une subvention pour encourager le, les pêcheurs de la façade nord pour atteindre les grandes profondeurs, euh, notamment situées au niveau de la façade nord de la Tunisie. Ces pêcheurs n'ont pas le droit de pêcher, d'utiliser ces bateaux créés sur la base d'une euh, subvention euh, spéciale de pêcher dans, euh, dans les, 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 les sites et les zones euh, centre et sud-est. Que cette catégorie des pêcheurs, ils n'ont pas le, le, le droit de, de pêcher au-delà de la façade euh, nord de la Tunisie. Ok, so that, that's a really interesting example. Just one question on that. Was that uh, those regulations, were they developed in collaboration with the fishers, did they have a say in this, or was it purely the government who decided this? Vraiment, je ne sais pas. C'est fait avec la direction générale de pêche. Je ne sais pas. Exactly. No, we often. But, but that's a nice example. We often don't know the the origins of the older legislation. I, I guess it was from the government yeah. at the very early beginning of the installation of the framework of the, of the fish, fishing activity in Tunisia. Yes, I, I would think, so. I would just guess, because often, you know, the, of the very early fisheries management, it was done very much as government. Sorry, sure, okay. but uh, yeah. Ahmed asked about that uh, uh, exception for the fishers on the northern uh, part of the country. And that decision, that exception has been uh, made uh, uh, doable thanks to an exercise that has been uh, done by the Ministry of Agriculture in collaboration with the fishers to, uh, to let them fishing in the northern part and not in the other parts of the countries. Okay, so that's a really interesting yeah. case study. That's great. Okay. Ils ne se bénéficient pas de euh, gasoil euh, subventionné dans les autres ports que euh, les ports situés dans la façade nord. Ok, yeah. no, that, that's a great, great example to have. Ok, <laughs> move on to the next one. So we've, so we've covered some of this. These are, uh, I want you to have this discussion first before we look at the different types of ownership. I think these are based more on how we think of ownership uh, of the land, uh, but it applies, uh, can apply equally if you think of access as opposed to ownership. We often don't own the, la the seabed or the water above it. Um, but so open access, we've already discussed. Uh, then you have communal uh, property or tenure rights as it called to certain areas of the sea as they have in the Pacific. Uh, I worked in Kenya and it was interesting there. Initially, everybody thought, including the Kenyan fishermen, uh, felt that it was all open access and had a lot of problems with it. And when they started to manage the fisheries and people started talking, particularly to the older fishermen, 
they said, oh, no, no, our village has the right to certain areas, and they've reintroduced uh, the traditional um, ownership and access process into the more modern regulations. Private property, of course, that is, we're very familiar with that on land, and there are relatively few cases of that in the sea. But if you extend that a little bit to companies and industry and think of uh, licenses for oil drilling or for mining or for other activities where certain parts of the seabed are put aside for certain activities by private companies, that becomes very relevant to thinking about your MPAs. Again, in the UK, we have to do a lot of work with our MPAs in relation to the renewable energy industry because our wind um, turbines, most of them are being put out at sea. And there's a sort of argument that goes on as to whether having a wind turbine inside your MPA is a damaging activity or is it actually beneficial because it works like an artificial reef and it, and it brings... So interesting debates, and so renewable energy suppliers are an important stakeholder in the UK for MPAs. And then state property, so that's, um, of course, fundamentally for um, the C, we have the EZs, EZs, uh, economic, um, ex exclusive economic zones, which were defined by the law of the sea. The Mediterranean, I know it's quite complicated because... <laughs> I'm not, you all know far more about that where your territorial and EZ uh, boundaries are, but that's uh, where, and uh, the um, Tunisia example was a little one of that. Next one. So when thinking about moving towards a more collaborative approach to management, these are all the issues you need to be thinking about. This concept of who has the right to use a certain area of the ocean. If you're making a new MPA, you really have to think very hard about that. Uh, if you, but if you've got an MPA already and you're doing zoning, you're doing a new zoning plan, you need to think about who feels they have the right to do certain things. Uh, another example, of course, is hotels. They like to have, they feel an ownership on that bit of beach outside the hotel and they may well want to have control over the shallow water in front of the hotel so that people can swim there. And you may get a conflict if fishermen want to come in there. So um, there's a lot of this, this sort of thing to be thinking about when you're planning collaborative approach. Um, but it does mean that if you start on this process and start thinking about these things, you get a much better uh, approach to decision-making with everybody feeling they're going to be benefiting from their share of the um, natural and social capital. So, so um, well, this is a bit... I've, I've actually run ahead of myself. We've kind of covered this a bit. So um, conventional fisheries management, we were talking about that. We had the nice examples there from uh, team, team one. Uh, and now we're moving much more to look at this, uh, these other approaches which are more collaborative. So, um, we, and I, I just want to emphasize again why, in the case of fisheries, that the, the fishing community is often the first, first uh, sector to see the value of this kind of approach. And we saw this so clearly yesterday in Gokova with the uh, fisheries cooperative. And we've had lots of examples uh, around the table. So, just to summarize, I think it's always useful to because you may need to do this yourself in justifying why you want to move towards a more collaborative approach. Just to summarize the big benefits which have come up in the discussions. People, if you've played a role in making a decision about how a place is going to be managed, if you've actually been involved, uh, you'll be much more willing to play your role in um, making the system work. We all know this in our own lives. If we're actually involved uh, in a decision, we're probably going to participate in the work to make it happen. Uh, if you have a collaborative approach and you have it all laid out clearly, everybody knows what, whose role is what, the whole management structure becomes more legitimate and transparent. You can explain to other people what you're doing and why. So the transparency is much more 
uh, increased. And in the old style government run uh, MPAs, that was, that's often a problem. And we still have that problem in the um, MPAs in the UK, where we often can't actually get the information. Uh, it's very slow to come out of the government. There's insufficient transparency. And that's one of the things we've been working on in the UK. And accountability, of course. And this is really important where you have getting donor funding. It's important for the government also. You need to be able to show what you're, what you're doing, but particularly important if you've got donors to show them uh, what the structure is, who's responsible for what, who's doing what. Uh, we've seen yesterday again in Gokova how if you have everybody involved, you can actually use... Uh, stakeholders can do some of the work. And we've seen an example of compliance and stewardship by having AKD plays a role with the fishermen and helps the MPA with enforcement, uh, makes it um, less expensive for the government to actually run the MPA. And we've mentioned earlier on the importance of it increasing the knowledge base. If you've got the knowledge of uh, the fishermen, the tourist industry, in our case, um, in the UK, uh, another sector we involve, it's called the marine aggregates. We have a lot of dredging of the seabed to get materials for road building. It comes from the seabed. Uh, and they have fantastic equipment and they've been monitoring a lot of our rarer species. So they provided the data when we were identifying our MPAs. So you could, get, you could involve universities. You, you want to involve everybody who can contribute information to the MPAs. And then this creates this collective awareness which makes an MPA a really important location uh, for people to come and experience a sustainable, um, sustainable livelihoods and an environment that's also well protected for biodiversity. So, uh, the legal frameworks, we've, I can go very quickly through that because we, through the exercise this morning, I think we all explored that and the importance of it. You really need to understand <coughs> the national framework and it must be clearly defined and where it's not so clear is when you start to get problems between ministries. Uh, everybody has these problems, you can't, not necessarily the role of an MPA manager to resolve it, but an MPA manager needs to be aware of it and to be able to help and advise. And then at the local led Le um, at the local level, we've also discussed in some of the countries, the municipal level is very important, the district level, the regional level. Uh, and if you haven't involved your local governments, it's probably something that would be good to be thinking of how you might be able to do to involve them, because they can also often provide support, or not necessarily financial support, but can contribute. Um, and then we've, we've discussed the rights-based management. This is just a diagram to show the complexity of it, but not so much to make you feel it's impossible, but just to show that if you bring all these components together, so you've got the government, you've got the fisheries stakeholders and rights holders, you've got the other coastal stakeholders, tourism, ports, industries, uh, you have the external uh, organizations, the NGOs and the universities and the marine institutes, uh, you've got the individuals themselves who depend directly on the area. If you bring them all together, that gives you your MPA co-management structure. So it may not be uh, full co-management. It might be more of a participative approach. But this diagram is particularly good to show you the people who need to be involved, the sectors that need to be involved. Right. And... This idea of creating a formal mechanism for it, that's the final stage once you've identified who, who everybody is. And again, we, we've heard a little bit, and I hope we'll hear some more after the next ex couple of exercises, about the mechanisms. I think Gokova, if I understood correctly, um, there you have a letter of good intention, was how Aisha described it. The NGO has a letter of good intention with the government. So it's not, it's not a legal contract, because that's presumably not possible in Turkey. <laughs> uh, in some countries, it may be a more formal 
delegation of management. In, in the Bahamas, the government delegates management of the MPAs to, uh, it's a large NGO called the Bahamas National Trust. And they, in that case, the National Trust is fully responsible and can also do the management enforcement is delegated as well. Uh, or it could be a more informal arrangement. There are, there are many different arrangements and it will very much depend on your national legislation uh, and the sectors that are involved and whether NGOs are at present and et cetera. So, this, uh, and so that, that's the um, management uh, 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 legal basis. And then the other thing you need, which has come up over and over again already, is the creation of a management body, uh, which again may be at, you may have several levels, one at the sort of ministerial level, bringing together the different ministries to, to be able to discuss and understand each other's roles in MPA management. And then you might have one at the site level. You could have committees at different levels bring together uh, the stakeholders, the managers, the government people to actually work out what are we doing this year, what's the budget, where are our funding needs, and then reporting back, uh, being accountable for, for the whole work. So it shouldn't rest on the MPA managers head alone, obviously. This is one of the really important reasons for having this broader management body so that the MPA manager themselves has support. And that the, the um, oops. <laughs> so, and then for that committee, they need to have terms of reference, a protocol for management, and uh, they need to understand exactly what decisions they can take and what they can't take. Okay. Okay, um, so these are um, the kind of exercise you'd need to go through uh, in your MPA when you're thinking about possibly setting up a co-management arrangement, if you haven't done already, uh, thinking about all the activities that might be in your management plan. Um, um, on the end of Tuesday, we went through activities that are done in, a, in an MPA, uh, thinking about who could do which activity because often the MPA manager and the staff can't do absolutely everything. You need to think about who would be best placed to help you do what. Data gathering, monitoring and evaluation, that can also, often also be done by an NGO or a, a university that's working with the MPA. Uh, might be citizen science, you might be able to have volunteers, local people collecting data. Decisions on the zoning, who has access to what, that's that might, that's more sensitive, you might want to do that within the committee. MPA manager obviously involved, but it must involve the stakeholders. The actual enforcement and protection that often may require a government, government involvement, or you might have a system like we saw at Gorkovo where the um, NGO uh, does the patrolling and then calls the Coast Guard if there's uh, an offence being committed. Uh, and then who does the planning, uh, and then who, it, it, just all the different activities that uh, you're all very familiar with because you're all involved with MPA management. You need to think about who does those and what can be possibly done by people other, other sectors rather than just the manager themselves or the government officers themselves. Next one. And there's just to remind us that we're going back to our natural and social capital. I won't go through this in detail, but just to remember the pressures on the natural capital, which will affect the social capital and uh, cumulatively lead to either major problems for your MPA, major problems for livelihoods, uh, or if you've got these being managed appropriately, will bring benefits for everybody. Next one. Another thing, given that we have here examples of MPAs that are being managed from the top-down level, we had that for Egypt, it was a very honest uh, statement there, to the much more collaborative approach. Um, in some countries, you just, at the moment, probably aren't in a position to do a, have a co-management arrangement. But that doesn't mean you can have much greater collaboration with your stakeholders. 
And these are the categories of different types of involvement for the stakeholders. And it's most simple, is what you call informed. You tell the fishermen what you're going to do. You tell the hotels what so the MPA is going to be there. Slightly better is where you actually consult with them before an act, um, action is taken. And you get input from uh, the stakeholders. And, um, but they, you don't necessarily have a discussion. So if there are different points of view, the government makes the decision. Then in many cases already, we've got a situation where we have a committee with and stakeholders have an advisory role and they can actually uh, put their views forward and have a real contribution to the decision making. But ultimately, it's probably the government who makes the final decision. In a true co-management arrangement where you've got a proper agreement, uh, it's an equal partnership and you'll take the decision by consensus possibly takes quite a long time, but there you've got a joint agreement. And then we're not really talking about this today here, but uh, in some countries you have community controlled areas where it is the local community that takes the decision and uses their traditional management structure for, for managing the area. And this shows the same thing uh, just graphically from uh, informing informing the stakeholders, consulting, actual collaboration, uh, joint decision making. And that leads to sort of full empowerment, uh, much more empowerment of the stakeholders and a sense of ownership for them. So we're now going to move on to the exercise, which is in your uh, packs there. And it's worksheet 4.1. Okay, so we don't have big ones to put on the walls. You just work in your table around the table. So there are a set of questions. There are eleven questions, but don't worry if you don't get through them all. Uh, <clears throat> you read the question uh, in relation to your, the MPA you're working on. So the first question is: Has the MPA acknowledged internally? Internally and publicly stated, oh, thanks, Patty. Yeah, and publicly stated that it just wanted to remind everybody that when talking about co-management, we're talking about it's a type of governance. It's the um, part of management or the way you are managing something. It's not an alternative to management. Management of your MPA goes on all the time. You have a management plan. This is where the language is so complicated. Um, but management is the actual things you're doing, <clears throat> led by you know, the MPA manager, whatever structure you have. And uh, in order for that management to happen, you must have a governance arrangement. And that could be either the government one, Hamid explained the Egypt one, where it is just the government, or it might be at the far level, totally the community, or it might be something in between, shared. And there are different uh, ways of doing shared governance and um, all sorts of names for it, which gets rather confusing. But the governance structure is, is essential for, for any, any enterprise, any activity. A hospital or a school will have a governance structure, and an MPA has a governance structure too, which involves uh, the legal aspects and who makes the decisions and as we've been talking about the rights. So j just to clarify that because I had a question about that. So to the exercise, um, <laughs> we can't possibly go through all these questions <laughs> at each table but I think what's best is, is each table picks uh, one of the activities where they wrote no to or they wrote partially or they had a query over and that led to a very good discussion because it seems to me that these questions are very helpful to think about uh, showing you how you approach stakeholders, all the different cultural issues involved, uh, how you actually get full participation and at what stage of the process you actually start talking to other stakeholders. So um, where should we start? I think you took so long over it, you should perhaps start first, but we don't want the whole discussion. <laughs> so just right, pick so up some of the 
a couple of the really key points. Yeah. Okay. Fifteen minutes, okay? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Um, Not yeah. The the um, the topic here is interesting uh, for one reason. We have a local uh, experience from our Egyptian colleagues how the MPA is interacting with the local community. And I, uh, on, um, personally, I have also some insights because I am from uh, a nearby country where this MPA is, and there is a lot of similarities in, in society between Libyan society and Saloum society. So, for example, the first question we talked about uh, uh, the need of community trust, uh, the, the need of MPA to gain the community trust uh, uh, so far. They said, uh, yes, we ha well, there were an engagement with the community at the stage of establishing the MBA. But unfortunately, after that, they're like uh, not very well connected to the local society. So we, we answered no, and we uh, gave three steps to the roadmap how to uh, deal with this issue. First of all, uh, shared government or co-management is not uh, uh, instated in the Egyptian law. So first of all, I wrote the word instill co-management in government policy. So this is like between the MBAs and the government before talking with the community. Once uh, the co-management is instilled in the uh, policy, even with a decree from the minister, doesn't need to be le uh, law, which takes a long time. So I told them you can take that decree and rush to it to the local leaders of the community, first of all, because it's a tribal community, so you don't speak to anybody, you speak to the leaders of the community, and show them that our minister is caring about you, and that's why they encouraged us to start to think about co-management, and you, you become part of the governance structure of the MBA. That's a, that's a very well uh, step to, to start then. Then, uh, um, uh, build the trust uh, with the local uh, leaders and also encourage them to uh, portray their traditional rules. Because his, um, Ahmed says and Mahmoud said in the past when we talk to uh, leaders, they say we have seasons where, we, where, where fishing is open, we have seasons where fishing is closed. So I told them this is the top science of management fisheries. But it, was, it is not written. So you need to encourage them to uh, uh, speak out and also re, as you said in the Pacific, reinforce them to uh, apply this system in the MPA. That's the first question. Thank you. That, that's great because that really gives an example. They've thought about who you should approach uh, in your stakeholder group. In this case, it's the leader because you, you do need to approach the right people. It's, a lot of psychology actually goes into this. Uh, thinking about what you do. So we talk in details, even uh, you, you invite them for lunch in the MBA first, and then you go to them second day. Because when you invite them, you, are, you have the initiative, and you have uh, the upper word on them. <laughs> exactly, and you should never forget the role of food in this, yes. Of course. <laughs> the, role, the role of food is important, and the role of venue is important. When you go to people, you ask people. When you invite people, you order people. So it's a lot of psychology in that process. Yes. So Could that's... you talk a little bit about uh, how to uh, reach the gender gap? Here? Yes. Uh, gender gap, I mean, it's... Um, I, uh, <laughs> I told Anne uh, we are in the registration semester. That's in the fifth semester. She said, no, we want something from the fifth semester to start in the registration semester. That's the first year. So I told her the best way in that community, which is very male-dominated, is to start to uh, visit schools, and in schools, usually, and in that community, usually the women are doing lots of teaching. So I, I told the, the colleagues, to, you can take a PowerPoint or a video uh, to, to the schools, and then uh, the science teacher, the biology teacher, will, will be rushing to you and start to ask for more. Maybe can you come to us again? Can you come to different classes? Can we do a, a drawing competition? Can we visit you in the MBA? So that's the start of the uh, connection with the, with, the, with the women. And through those, those teachers, female teachers, those are your proxy to, to get to the wider uh, female community. The other way, uh, I, I believe, uh, which is very successful, is to uh, ask those teachers, because they are educated, they speak the language, 
So, uh, it's common language, I mean. So, they, uh, you ask them about what handicrafts the, the women are doing in your community, for example, related to, to sea. Do you do anything with the, uh, related to the sea? Do you use shells, for example, from the shore? Do you use uh, any other uh, uh, marine products or even a coastal product uh, using the palm leaves or anything? So you, you can start to have a seed funding to buy those uh, local products and then sell them in your visitor center. And then you start, uh, you're starting up a business cycle that's uh, built on demand and, um, you know, uh, request and, and selling. So that, that, like, like I mean, you started another cycle, another connection with different uh, set of women who are usually housewives. They can do handicrafts for you. You, you. you make them earn some money. So they start to feel the importance of the MBA. And believe me, um, mothers uh, there, although they look like very isolated and things, but they are very crucial in the family. They're doing a great uh, work in raising their kids. And many times I've told them they are the men of the, of the house. There is a male in the house and there is a man in the house, which is the, <laughs> the lady. So they are the real, uh, I mean, uh, real, uh, real leaders of the family uh, because they are uh, usually they have a, a good skills of planning uh, money, uh, how to spend, uh, many things. I think all of you knows that. So it's, it doesn't mean North Africa only, even in Europe. Many, many families are built on, on women that uh, the man is earning money and she is the engineer how to spend that money. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That's nice to have it because I think some of the groups didn't get down to the gender question. Um, obviously, that's just so important. We, we saw it with the women's uh, role in the cooperative yesterday in Gokova. And the other, uh, my point on the gender is to seek out uh, role models, women who are already participating in MPA management in one form or another. And I would like to acknowledge the role models we have women involved in MPAs here. That's very good. So. And the men are very good, but you, as you acknowledge yourself, ideally it should be 50 50. Yeah. Um, team two, you had a very animated discussion on the first uh, one or two questions. Uh, they, they had difficulty with the translation, which wasn't very clear. So, but anyway, you clearly had a very useful discussion. So, yes, we, we always have uh, useful and cons constructive uh, discussions. So, I'll talk a uh, little bit about our uh, MBA uh, uh, Al Husima National Park who is uh, an MP co-managed by, uh, by an association, uh, NGO, and the National Park. So, so in, in, uh, we've done a partnership, uh, uh, a partnership with this uh, NGO that allowed, allowed us to work together in legally. So uh, in our uh, model, uh, that, that uh, partnership is more in, uh, compli uh, is more complementarity than other things. Other things. Because you know the administration it could not do everything alone. So there are some activities that we, can, we can't do anything. So this, this NGO, this NGO is, is complementar, complementarity tasks that, that, it, that, uh, that could do. So uh, another thing, is uh, the 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 co-management we have uh, in this MPA uh, 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 some like uh, uh, workers that uh, the old fishermen that used to 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 be fisher bef before, and now they 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 play the the role of uh, intermediates be be between the the the, the fishermen and the administration. Uh, they ha the, uh, we could we, we can't like talk directly with fishermen because uh, one thing is they talk a different language Berber they are all Berbers and we we um, we are the managers we come from other places they don't they, there is a language gap one thing so the NGO picked one of the fishers. Uh, to use to, uh, a, pro, a protesting fisher that used to be protesting a lot, and he plays the the intermediate. 
So when we want, when there is and the, when there is a problem in the marine area, fishers report to this to this man, and they report to the administration. So this is a, 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 a important point in our MPA. And other thing, we we've done a project with the, the with the NGO to uh, uh, involve the the women the the wives the wives of uh, fishers in in fabricating uh, baskets like like we saw yesterday we call them uh, traps uh, in French we call them lenas uh, and um, uh, um, uh, much bigger than the yesterday they have uh, like uh, big uh, gaps not like uh, smalls like we send every day to allow the small fishes to to, to go out, so uh, now now they they have an activity that could make them money. They fabricate nuts, and the NGO buys 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 these baskets or traps from them, and they sell it on the the market. And now, when when a woman of the fisher are work, are working in this, the the, the fishers are are like uh, you know outreached. Indirectly, indirectly, do you know that there is uh, there is work done in the in this uh, MPA? We have to protect the this uh, this uh, area. There is no take zones to respect, and now the, they are more uh, uh, aware of this uh, of this uh, MPA. The, a double benefit. Yeah. They 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 find more fish, and the, their wives make makes be, make uh, benefits. And it's a, it's, a, it's a good example. It, it's a, that's a fantastic example, yes. yeah. A really, really good. It, it, it was, it was the, 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 the main <laughs> point to integrate them in, in a certain way to convince, uh, to convince uh, fishers, uh, fishers to, to, uh, to adhere to, the, to our, our uh, strategy and vision. Yes, and it's, that's such a good point, getting the whole family, the wives yes. uh, involved, and then everybody. A, a little bit like uh, Hamza's point also of uh, talking to children, getting yes. it. Um, and the, 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 the problem was, uh, uh, at first, not finding a market for these yeah. uh, uh, traps. The NGO b b buys from them to avoid, to avoid, this, to avoid this problem. <laughs> and then they... They, they sell it. Yeah. They sell it. So you've uh, got a market as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, That's we right. have a local market, <laughs> direct <laughs> market, and, and so so they can feel uh, comfortable and uh, they keep going. Okay. It's not about fabricating uh, a, a little number then. then exactly. So it's sustainable. Yeah. Sustainable. Yeah. Sustainable, yes. yeah. Okay, and the other important point there was this idea that even if we talk about the fishing community, but of course that's uh, many sectors in the many different uh, classes of people in the fishing sector, and the older fishermen are often so important for MPAs. Yes. Um, I had that experience in East Africa. It was the, they're called the Mze, and they're, they're the elders, and uh, they were really important. They were the ones that came to all the meetings and made sure that the other fishermen were fully involved. And when I went to England, I found and was working in England on our MPAs, uh, where we had our stakeholder groups, we found that often it was the older fishermen who came intentionally to say what they'd done in the past that they'd like to see reintroduced because we did have some good management times. And then also they understood that they would have more influence on the younger fishermen yes. who might not be so, co so keen to be involved. Yes, so, that's, so. And one of the uh, strange points is to have one of them in your team. One of the fishes exactly. in your team. Okay. It, 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 he's going to facilitate, uh, like every, it, exactly. Every. Yes, having the right representative actually yes. on the on the group. Okay, uh, T. We'll go on quickly now because we've got one more exercise to get in. But some feedback quickly from. I just want to say also the older fishermen have a huge amount of wealth, knowledge, a wealth of knowledge. And they, you know, they're working from a baseline that goes back much further. And so the changes they've seen are profound and to be able to communicate that as well. Would one of you just uh, pick out, if you just pick one of the questions or one of the points. Just one of the points. And 
Okay. Uh, yeah, for Bayer, uh, for uh, Balm Island, uh, as you know, this is the staff of this MBA uh, trying to uh, do the best without, unfortunately, any uh, authority to control. Uh, however, uh, many uh, uh, meetings uh, maybe uh, with uh, stakeholders and uh, personal level uh, to uh, uh, to awareness and to more to raise the awareness level and education for the local community. Uh, in fact, the MBA uh, secure the uh, level of input from the local community uh, from the uh, access fees. Uh, however, uh, this area, uh, this uh, protected area, need for more uh, impact uh, activity like land use uh, fees or etc. Uh, this area need to, uh, this MBA need to uh, communicate more with the uh, local community and fishermen uh, as well uh, to identify their priorities and their uh, interest uh, to put in the uh, uh, vision of the MBA. A question I'd like uh, to deal with this. Uh, Thank you, Muhammad. Uh, in fact, uh, the question that I have that, uh, so we hear to stakeholders. Sometimes stakeholders, when you hear to them, uh, they told you a lot of things, but it is not the rule of the MPA. So it's the rule of the ministries. This is what happened in general in Lebanon. So for example, when we go with fishermen and fishers, let's say, we talk to them, they like, say a lot of things, but it's not the, the job of the MPA to do it. So we are, we are between these two kind of things. So we are hearing, yes, the question here is very perfect and very, very good. But there is some, some interesting things that we come back to them. No, it's not. No, we come back to them if there is some results. But how we can come back to them and we don't have any result and we know that the law or the regulation will not change. That is so important. So. Uh, uh, that, that's yeah. the point. And concerning management convention, I have a discussion with Sue about it. Uh, in first of all, when I saw co-management, I was like a little bit like uh, scaring because we are doing a management plan. So should we do a co-management plan also? She, she told me, no, it's like about sharing. That's so yes, it's better. So to say, for example, sharing stakeholders, better than co-management, let's say. Because it's not easy in our country to to manage and co-manage, so it's the same in, in a way or other, so that's the point, yeah. So, so <laughs> yes, you just have one management plan, but hopefully you will have done it on a co-collaborative sharing basis with your stakeholders, yeah, yeah, yeah. so that they're involved. Yeah. And also the implementation is built around right. that yes. co-management. Collaboratively, you'll implement the plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And yes, we, we don't take in, yeah, don't take in consideration uh, the point of gender during our uh, stakeholders' uh, meeting, to be honest. So we just uh, say we need a representative from each stakeholders and uh, anyone who comes, we come, so to be honest. So, and we cannot do it because if you call them, we say we need this woman or we need this guy, it's not our, uh, our problem, it's not our like, stuff to choose. They choose who will be uh, this, this thing. thing. So that's, that's an important, also another important point. So. Yes, just on the gender. So that's why you might be interested to talk about the Al Hazima example, because yeah. that's really interesting, Very talking interesting. to the wives and in Libya, thinking about going to schools. Yeah. Uh, I can share with you a small experience uh, with uh, co Fisherman Cooperative in Akkar, north than uh, our MPA. Uh, and here we can do a role as MPA, MPA by link by make a link between fishermen and, and some project for example they have a problem they, they uh, put their boat inside a river at the border with syria but each year uh, the sand come and block the entrance of uh, the river so they always they have this problem uh, so I, I linked them with a project uh, with uh, world vision they have a, pro a project in Lebanon, so they give them uh, a generator that can take sand in from inside. Uh, we put it outside and they then come back. But for each two, three months, we, they open the, the entrance of the, of the river. So it's, 
MPA can do a role by linking fishermen cooperative and uh, fishermen with programs that are present in the area. It's, uh, I give you an example. I link them with World Vision International and they give them to the cooperative this instrument. It's about three or four hundred, four thousand dollars, but uh, it, it makes an important solution for them. Yeah, that was a perfect example of the role the MPA can play. So that it's not a huge investment, it's not money the MPA is putting in, it's the technical advice and the knowledge and the networking that an MPA can provide for the local community. So, okay, and I think I, we I just want to yeah. make one quick comment about reaching audiences or stakeholders that we don't normally, just because I know Ali's in the, in the throes of a management planning process that I, th I think there's always been, in every culture, people who typically show up when you call a meeting. And, and it's been typically men in most cultures. I think for you to have a concerted effort to reach out to women, you're going, we were talking about this in this group over here, that you'll find that you get very important information that's very different from a group of women than you will from a group of men. And I think it's just having the tools of knowing how to reach new groups and what's comfortable. And when I'm working in a new community, I often use mapping tools because everybody really, um, it's a really easy way to visualize what's happening. And um, I've worked a lot in, uh, amongst everywhere else, Southeast Asia. And I found out that when we started, instead of ex inviting the women to come with the men, they won't come. But if you go to the women and have a women's group and you do a mapping exercise to identify the priorities in an MPA, you'll get very different information than you will from just men doing the same thing. They don't all have to meet together, but that provides you with a much more multidimensional and robust data set about what's important to a co local community if the women also provide input into that process. And then the other thing that we're realizing is that we're missing younger people altogether. And, and you know, I think you have to go to people on their own basis. And social media has allowed us a new entry point into younger people because almost globally, younger people um, are best connected with through social media. And I'll tell you my experience working in several places where the theme has been where, how can we get younger people more involved in conservation? We feel like the older people are carrying the load. And it's been, do it on their terms. Have a party, have a gathering. Don't have a meeting. Don't send out agendas. That's not the way that they respond. Find the ways that they respond. So you have music, you have food, and then you, ha you can have open discussion platforms. So find the entry point that's meaningful to that, that sector that you're trying to include. And I think we're finding it's much more, this is particularly true with climate, where, where are the young people on this conversation? It's theirs now. It's not ours anymore. And so how do you bring them to the table? And I think we're going to have to start casting our net further to bring in all those important sectors that are missing. And I think you'll find it so much richer to get the, the interests of, of a broader group. Sorry to say that, but it's a big theme that I'm working on in climate right now, is okay, where are the young people? Where, you know, where are the women in the conversation? Uh, their interests are gonna be very different and you have to bring that into the mix. So. Um, no, that, that's a good introduction because the, um, the next part where we're going to talk a bit more about how we work together in these groups once you've identified your um, stakeholders and you're starting to set up your management committee or your, your management team, just trying to think what this might mean in practice. And it was a very good um, mention of the mapping technique because um, I think... The way we're working in, with three groups today, where you've got different countries around the table and you're sharing your experience, you're having to work 
It's a perfect example of working collaboratively to do certain things. Okay, you're all on the same course, but you're actually working together as three teams. And what was the very first exercise, we drew a map of the MPA and this activity of uh, drawing a map of what the main issue is, the main place is. It always brings people together and helps to generate this understanding. So here we are, uh, the dynamics of participatory groups. And uh, you can think about your MPA uh, groups, but you can also think about how you've been working over the, this week. Um, and so you've got to, ideally, you've got to work together uh, to, bring, to make the group of people, they need to understand what the common purpose is. So this week, the common purpose is to learn this approach to to management. Uh, in the MPA, the common approach is to uh, preserve the natural and social capital, now that we've got the terminology. And you need to do this in a way that we build the, um, uh, that's generally respectful enough. So this comes into the equity issues we talked about and accepting people's points of views, recognizing their rights. And then from generally moving across to be thinking about us as a group rather than me or I as an individual. Uh, and that means working in particular ways. So uh, next one, Patty. So um, these are four key areas to be thinking about. And we've, I think we've addressed all these just in the three teams this week. And we'll go through them. Next one. So. In a group, you really need full participation, okay? Everybody around the table needs to be participating uh, and not sort of sta standing back. Equally, everybody needs to be able to say what their view is. There needs to be this uh, respect um, as to what other people's views are. Uh, even if you're sort of worried that you haven't, sometimes people have stood up and said, oh, I'm not sure. But that doesn't matter. You, voice, you put your voice forward, you explain, either ask a question or you put out your concerns. And that gives yet another element. You move on to a new element to discuss. And you then start to learn the points of views of everybody around the table. And some people may have be very focused on the biodiversity. Some people may have very much a livelihood focus. Uh, some people may want to stick to the rules. So you all have different views and are trying to bring this together. We also need to have, I wasn't quite sure of the purpose of the, <laughs> this thing. Um, it does take time. That's an important thing to realize about this. You may think you could have covered this curriculum just in one day. Why are we here for a whole week? Because actually it takes time to mutually get to agree and understand these different things from everybody's perspective. Excellent. And then shared responsibility. In the case of, of an MPA um, stakeholder group, uh, they will, everybody in the team, in the group, starts to understand that they have a responsibility as well as being able to take place, they uh, take part in the process and uh, be part of the decision making that then puts a certain onus on them, a certain responsibility. They then have a role to play themselves. Um, and there's also the other side to that is um, that it's important to realize, because some people can get very carried away. It all seems like suddenly collaborative management, and we have a stakeholder group, and we're going to solve all the problems. And they might rush into agreeing to it. Uh, rather too quickly without reflecting carefully on what it might mean long term. So that's another reason for making sure the process goes slowly so that people don't take decisions that they might regret afterwards. So that's just bringing it all together. Um, there's the sort of personal and collective uh, benefits and growth from this. Uh, that will lead to agreements because at the end of the day, as we've mentioned, depending on the legal situation and the context, you'll have some kind of agreement with your stakeholders. And then we talked also about this several times, that these partnerships, these sharing arrangements, we don't want them just to last for a couple of years, just as uh, because it was done through a project and then once the project's over, we'll stop sharing. Uh, management. We want it to be a lasting partnership 
And if you build the relationship, I love the fact that when we met the uh, fisherman yesterday, he remembered Anne uh, from previous visits. So already a partnership was there. He saw the, could start to see the relationship there. Okay, next one. So just the stages of, um, if you were to be setting up a collaborative uh, arrangement and um, even if you're not doing a formal one, this is still a useful exercise to do. If you can get a stakeholder, often it's just useful to get a group of stakeholders together and go through this process. So you identify the issue that you want to deal with. <clears throat> so it'll be the MPA, but what are the objectives? Being really clear about understanding, getting people to ask questions making sure that you all understand the language. We've seen just in this room how important <clears throat> language is for creating confusion. And for a start, we don't all speak the same language, and many words sound the same in French and English and get translated differently. You need to spend time making sure you actually understand. I thought Ali's question to me about co-management and management and governance was very important, and that was a language issue. It wasn't that Ali didn't understand, it was, it was purely language. Um, okay, the next one. Uh, then we've talked a lot about how you identify stakeholders and getting the right mix. Um, Anne's point just now about how often if you call a meeting, it'll be the same person who comes forward because they like to speak or something. And it's much better if you do some work beforehand to actually find out who the right representative is so that you get uh, full representation. So, for example, you might want to have some women at the meeting if, uh, if previously you haven't. Um, and then making sure that the group is, um, we talked about this with age, that you have got sort of good cross-representation of the different um, people, sectors, ages, genders. Uh, make sure you've got the expertise there too. And we, that's come up several times. You do want people who know the situation. Don't, you don't just want to have an old fisherman because we need to tick the old box, but actually he's somebody who can't really contribute. We want somebody who definitely, maybe it's a woman in that society who actually has the information. It would be better to have them. So that, as um, somebody said, you can't go and necessarily and choose the people yourselves, but you, in conversations with the right people, you can make sure you bring the right people in. And then you may find there are gaps. Uh, perhaps at the first meeting you're missing one sector, as again, it's not something to be too anxious about, but as soon as you realize there are gaps, to start filling them for subsequent um, uh, meetings. I, for the uh, English MPA thing, we had um, uh, six, more than 60 multi-sector stakeholder meetings in 18 months that we had to set up and manage. And the first ones were all quite rocky <laughs> because we found people were missing or we had the wrong representatives. And slowly, over time, we got them right. And by the end, we had the teams were working really, really well together. Next one. Uh, funding. OK, we're going to talk a lot about funding. This is just in the context of doing uh, stakeholder planning and participatory work. It's, you know, it seems, often seems a bit exciting to start with. You do need to make sure. Uh, because you don't want to raise expectations amongst the stakeholders. You do need to make sure that you've actually got it planned out as a process so that you can keep it running. Uh, so that does mean having some funding identified, even if you don't have it in the bank, know where you're getting it from, because you can really get things going on one meeting. And as we've said anyway, you want a process that goes on. So you need to have in your budget some funding for holding meetings. You need to know the costs of the meetings, how people are going to get there, and, and think about um, who, you know, whether you need some technical uh, help or something like that. Uh, one thing that I found very important is well, if you want fishermen to come to the meeting, you have to think about not only what time of day, but what the tides are. Mm. Probably less important in the Mediterranean, actually, but. Uh, we used to have to have meetings at all different times of days because fishermen were out fishing and we wanted to make sure that we held them at times that were suitable for them. 
And the same thing, if you want to involve women, there are going to be certain times of day it's easier for them to come along. Next one. And facilitation, this is, this is so important. Uh, in England, we started doing our stakeholder groups without professional facilitators. And after about a month or so, we had a lot of problems with the fishermen. They got very aggressive. And in the end, we found the funding and we brought um, professional facilitators in. Uh, I mean, they went round. We didn't have a facilitator for each group. And the difference was absolutely huge. And they had all sorts of techniques. Uh, I mean, Anne knows a lot of them. We're using some of them here anyway, but there are more. And they really know how to... Um, take that it's a lot of it is time and you give people time you have a meeting and then you give people time to reflect and you might have some other sub or meetings or one and one discussions so that when people come back to the table they're more relaxed and understand a bit more so um that's i think facilitators are really worth thinking about if your stakeholder situation is a little bit rocky um and it is by nature. <laughs> she, she, she will be rocky, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, and so then the other thing to do is to decide what, you, at the, right at the beginning, what are we going to do within a certain time span? What are we actually going to do? Because you can't, you're not going to solve all problems and having some very clear uh, goals that can actually be achieved because there's nothing like setting up a group uh, that then they start to feel disappointed because they don't feel they're making progress. They don't quite know what the end point is. Uh, and again, I've been involved with some MPA projects where we have actually had that problem. It often happens if the, it's project-based and the funding comes to the end and you've got these very committed groups of stakeholders ready to play a role in the MPA and the funding to maintain the groups goes. And that's where there hasn't been enough planning before and perhaps in the course of the uh, discussions with the stakeholders, people have got over keen and have started planning far too far ahead beyond the scope of what was actually originally planned. Okay, next, next one. Uh, so again, a very good thing on the first meeting is you actually work out what are we going to do this is, and have a very simple agenda. Often the first agenda is very simple. People getting to know each other, um, having a timeline, deciding how often you're going to meet, and how, la how long, etc. all the logistics. Okay. And uh, ah, this is uh, an important thing, is actually making sure that stakeholders know why the process is happening. And I think that was one of the questions on the previous exercise. Uh, making sure that people have the information up front that they need to be able to come to a meeting. There's nothing worse than coming to a meeting and not quite knowing what's going to happen. So people need to be briefed as work, and that's often the role of the MPA, or if you're lucky, an NGO, who can actually brief everybody. This is what's happening, and we want you to come together about it. In Cambridge, we have a big argument going on across the city about new transport system for Cambridge, because our traffic congestion is so bad. And a couple of weeks ago, they brought out a new plan, very no information in it, and they've invited everybody to comment. And everybody said, I can't comment, I don't know. <laughs> will, will, will I still have a bus to go to work? Or are you stopping the buses? Will I be able to park my car? And it's a perfect example of a bad consultation because the, the, the stakeholders haven't had the information that they needed before. So... In the case of MPAs, we do better than that. <laughs> we provide the information in advance. Excellent. So, uh, the next exercise, which is again in your work pack, and it is uh, 4.3. Um, this is to look at um, how the different sectors that you've uh, identified, the different groups. So this you can actually go back today... Whichever exercise, it should be on your wall. You'll find it. You identified stakeholder groups. Some of you did just tourism. Some did fisheries. One team did fisheries, didn't they? You can use those plus uh, just quickly thinking about the sectors in the... Uh, if you did tourism, think about fisheries as well and vice versa. 
So um, the idea is to identify the different roles that they might pay in a shared governance model of your MPA. Um, so uh, in the, the, the top one is small-scale fishers, because I think everybody's got small-scale fishers in their park. But as we said, they may not be, it may not be a um, homogenous group. There may be different sectors within that group. So you need to think about that. Different types of gear or different size boats, I don't know what it would be. Uh, and then what, what you feel, how you feel they should be engaged. So at the simplest, should be kept informed. Well, probably you tick that for all. Um, informal con consultation. Would you actually, are you actually able to have a system where you could go out and consult with them or bring them in? Um, can they play a role in providing expertise? Is there a technical uh, role they, can, they could be providing? Um, and then to what extent can they be involved in decision making uh, just through uh, initial consultations or actually would you be able to have them represented on the management committee or the management team or whatever your structure is? Or can they be doing something else such as monitoring or enforcement? So the various roles they might play and how they'll be engaged. Uh, we, can't, we haven't got time to do everything. I suggest you just do one example, perhaps, from each group, because there are some on the back of the page, too. But just maybe just start with the first page. Yeah, is that all right, Anne? Yeah. It's not critical. It's really just to run through the process of thinking, ah, this group plays this role, this group, yeah, these are secondary beneficiaries. We probably don't, we may not want them to be fully engaged, but it's most important that we have, we keep them informed, or most important that we have an initial consultation. Okay. Fifth, yeah, okay, we'll do, f okay, we'll do 15 minutes and then we've got lunch and we can perhaps, yeah, we can discuss it after lunch, okay? So just write on your paper. Most of it you've gone through this morning anyway, so it should be quite quick to do. Okay? It's okay. Uh, maybe, uh, and also, please. And yeah, Madam Sohad, of course, of course, yeah. Dora? Yeah. Yeah, also Sue? Go, go Sue. I was helping you. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we are two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. And after this, 18. So, <laughs> so 18, it's like, uh, so two group? Uh, 18, 19, 19, please join us. It's 12 with you, please. Okay, so two group of 10, 10, please. So a group, oh, but it's okay, come here, we need her. <laughs> yeah, we should have uh, two group of 10, 10, so. So, yeah, uh, are you ready? Because you, <laughs> wait, 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 look, look, look something. I will, I will join them for the photo group is better first. <laughs> so, yeah, now take it. <laughs> because I need also to be present in the group photo, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Anna, please. Okay. Where is this one? Silly photo! Yeah. Do <laughs> Freestyle. Freestyle. <laughs> so, so now we can continue the training. We finish our ice break. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Madame Sohad, come, come. We're not finished. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So go for it. So everyone have a number. So this is your number. This is your number. 
Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's your number. It's your number. Please, uh, someone help me. So, Patty, please, to gain time. So, uh, okay. So, 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 please divide into two two teams. So, two teams. It's ten, ten, no? Two, four, six, seven, eight. No, no. Eight. Come. Come with us. Right. Eight, nine, nine. Okay. Right on. And and you join join us, no? Two, four, six, eight, ten, two. Eight, nine, eight, and, and we need you. So please. With the other team, man. Yeah, yeah. So right. And this is your number, man. So the idea, every one of you have a number. You see, from zero, four, five, something like this. So the game said that I should like give you a total number. Let's say, for example, something. And you should like regroup it in your team. You understand me? So, for example, let's start. Regroup this number, 25401. So each group should talk to each other. And fast, 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 fast. Yeah, yeah, go fast. Fast, 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 fast. Fast, fast, fast. Yeah, yeah, fast, fast, fast. Fast, fast. Fast, go. Yeah, okay. So this, this group one. So. So, <laughs> so the, the idea, be careful, because, yes, in fact, you should choose, you should use all your number. If there is a zero, it's normal. You can put it before the two. It's a game. So, okay, be smart. Okay. So, this is the second one. So, fast. Go for it. Go for it. Fast, fast, fast. Fast, fast, fast. Fast, fast, fast. Okay, great. Perfect. <laughs> so. So we are, so I don't know, we have two zeros, so. <laughs> so the, the last one, the most important one, you are ready? So, yeah, one, two. One, zero. Oh, very good, very, very much. Yeah, yeah, but, but, there is, but there is something that the people uh, in, in back, they don't use the number. Zero. So zero should be before, before, before the one. Yeah. So you should use all the people. Ah, now you win. Now look at it. Look, now they win. So that's the idea. Yeah. So uh, another question: Who, who can tell me what is this number? What is this number? Yeah. So go, 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 go. So it is the superficie of Lebanon, 10,452 kilometers square. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now that we everybody's awake. <laughs> Thank you, Ali, for this icebreaker. I think we're going, we're going to be hired for this, <laughs> for all the events. Um, yeah, so we are going to continue now um, here. Building a co-management uh, framework. So we are going to work through the, through the model. Um, we are going to do one more exercise, some more questions, but then later we are going to build a model of uh, putting into all together what they have done during these days. Here is an example of a co-management framework. In this case, it's um, fisheries, okay? Here is in Vietnam, in Khao Hai Lagoon. And uh, here in this model, it says well, it's important to consider, we already talked about all of this, so I think I will go a bit, you know, uh, move forward, but, you know, it's good to have some reminder for what we're going to do today, this afternoon. Um, it's important to create awareness of the value of ecological conservation, so that the stakeholders, uh, for example, if we're talking about fishers, that they know uh, what is the value of the resources, why they, we are protecting this, uh, this MPA. And then to have, of course, the support of the local government. 
and secure funding for fishing associations, so they have uh, this income also for the longer term, and uh, have good leadership with fishing associations. So choosing a representative of the fishers, for example, if we are talking about fishers, but we can think also about tourism, other sectors, but having a representative for, for association that it's um, sharing the, the, the values of most of the group, of the main um, uh, people. Of, uh, then the cooperation among fishers, so it's important that there is a good cooperation between these groups. And then also, as a reminder, um, it's important to create a community or local fisheries management body. Can be in the form of council of co or committee. So in each of the regions, uh, MPAs will have different ways uh, to have this. Um, like for example, um, when I was working in South America, Principe, with the local community, some some fishers. Uh, there were many communities in the island, and some fishers didn't want actually to create an association, but at least they chose a representative uh, of the community. Uh, so the different places can work a bit different. Um, but um, it's important to provide a formal structure for the decision making also to know who's going to take these decisions for the day-to-day -day management. So who's going to do the management. And, and MPA management also should be integrated into this co-management structure. We already talked about the different co-management structure in the different places, MPAs that we are working. So we already discussed that. And also, each stakeholder group needs to have a strong representative, as I was saying before, that is, a spec is represented by that group and then can serve as a spoken person. So it's important that the other uh, community members or the other group, uh, group members, they trust, they, they have trust in that person because it's going to represent the values and views of the, of the rest. And then they can, you know, de delegate. Um, also, it needs to be, uh, cohesive and work well together, ideally. <laughs> um, there was always going to be some conflicts, but we need to know how to manage them. Um, and must have an awareness of the need uh, to conserve the resources and see the value in working together with the NPA. I think this is one of them, yeah, also very important thing. Uh, to, we were talking also doing capacity building with the stakeholders to create this awareness because they need to have the knowledge and also the same knowledge when they are sharing uh, their, their opinion with the rest of the, of the stakeholders. So having, having this knowledge is, gives them power so they, they feel this uh, empowerment. So this is um, also important when, when having this structure. Mm. What else? Um, they need to be confident at the risks are involved uh, on the, with making changes. Um, so I was commenting that before. So they need to know, well know these risks. And they, they may need to support in these alternative livelihoods. So we were talking before about other types of, um, a part of fishing. So for example, uh, with, the, with the women um, and se selling that they sell, for example, things. And when I was working in Jose San Tome and Principe, um, the, the women that they, they were, the, the role it was to sell the fish. So they are called palayes. So they are not the ones fishing, but they are the ones to sell the fish. And we were also helping them to create new business, alternative business. We were commenting before about these things. So they also have a role, and they also, um, it's important to consider them in this, in this process. Mm, they need to be provide rights to, uh, to the resource, uh, resources under their management. Uh, we're talking already about these rights, no? which kind of rights they're going to have, which kind of access. And they need formal recognition of the role in the resource management. So they are spending their time being in this uh, co-management uh, team. So it's important to recognize that. Then uh, they, are, they have diverse views and values. But this is important also that they have different, different views and values because we can understand each other and find a common ground. That is very important. And uh, then we need to choose these stakeholders carefully to represent the whole sector. So all the different uh, opinions that we may have, or the main ones. And so it's important this to establish it at the beginning so we don't have conflicts or we try to avoid them. Um, build capacity to, to empower groups, we really say that. 
Delta Foundation of Transparency and Trust. It's important that they are aware of all the process and they have completely transparency and they trust the process. Uh, being able to have consistent, so this is part of also facilitators, no? uh, being able to consistent, be friendly and equally to everybody, so everybody in the group should have this. And encourage equal representation and participation. Um, always consider minority groups, so maybe some that they are underrepresented. So this is important to consider all the different uh, types of stakeholders that we may have and uh, to don't leave anyone behind the process that we think could be important to have their opinion. And then identify common ground from the beginning. So we establish that from the beginning, then it's easier to, to move forward. Then, uh, okay, after this uh, recap, so these are some things that we already saw. And uh, we are going to do a last, uh, well, before the model, <laughs> an exercise of um, we'll see, using the worksheet 4.3. So here, I, uh, thank you, thank you, sir. I will just, yes, here. So then here we have the 4.3. So we have actually three, three topics within, so you will see this out of questions. <laughs> Mm, but uh, do as much as you can uh, from the three. Uh, so one is, uh, if you are there, one is basic framework for a co-management team. And there are some questions about that. The other is more to the process for decision making. And the last one is about stakeholder engagement in implementation. So. It is more, more than answering uh, all those questions. This, may, this is going to be very helpful to think about more and more in depth about the MPA management. And then for later, for building the model. So just a, just a reminder of this. Um, after doing this, we are going, so we already work on the environmental, the natural capital, on the socioeconomic, uh, so social capital. And then we are now working in integrated governance and management, so the co-management. Um, so then all this is going to, to be important for, for this part that we are going to do in, in, a, in a bit. So any questions that you have, let us know, so we will be around. Um, we have, uh, we can say, I don't think we can to spend, I think 30 minutes is fine. And then later we will move uh, for, the, for the model. <laughs> I hope these questions uh, made you some thinking. Uh, it's important uh, through thinking about the next part of the... Now we are going um, to put everything together of what we have done these last days. I am... Mm -hmm. So here we have the, the first part that we have done the first day about the natural capital, um, which is an, um, here, okay, in, for this group. Then we have the next one about the social capital, about uh, the activities, and we have all this um, here, yeah, here, okay. And then the last one that we have done today, um, also part of it yesterday, you have two parts. We have, the, we have work on the MPA management planning and an MPA co-management. So this is actually, we have already worked through it. Uh, remember this, yes, yeah, this four steps on, we have worked through assigning uh, MPAs to enhance livelihoods, uh, managing the impacts, uh, removing the barriers, and supporting the livelihoods. So what we are going to do now is to put everything together, okay? So we have already this, we have this, uh, so natural capital, social capital, and we are going to work through this to put all as one model, um, integrated and sustainable MPA model. And it's important to think that if there, there are already things on your uh, integrated management, that you are not doing, but you are thinking that you could do things that you can change. You can also make 
new a new management okay model so this is the one that you have but if there are things it's better to simplify it because we have to think also about the next day so tomorrow we are going to go forward on how you are going to sell this uh, like uh, and the, how we want to show this to potential funders uh, to have for, for financing so um, we need to make one model that is clear as clear as possible and also thinking how we would like that is the best for each of the MPAs, each of the cases. So I don't know if you want to add something soon, maybe to, or you think it's clear. Yeah. Let's let's go. So we are going now to uh, work on this. Okay, this taking into account all what we have done uh, already yesterday, and this is going to be. This is an example. Okay, so. You can use this as, a, as a, an example. Um, and later we will present each of the teams to everybody so we can get feedback and we can talk and discuss a bit about it. Any doubts so far on this? Ah, uh, yeah, you do that on the flip chart. So maybe, yeah, I think it can fit in one, but if you need to use two, maybe it's easier one for this and one for this. So we can put all together in one, in one model. Um, I don't know if you want, maybe you want going to, no, it's okay? Okay, yeah, yeah, you're going to present the whole model uh, to all the groups, so we will present it here and we'll make a, a, we will sit around and also give feedback to each other, which it will be very interesting. Um, any doubts? Okay, so we have, we will be around anyways. <laughs> We have um, how much? Uh, 30 minutes. 30 minutes, a bit longer, maybe. Uh, at four o'clock is going to be the coffee break, and then later we can do the discussion. We'll bring the coffee back in here. Okay, Okay, Go ahead. Uh, so now we have uh, finished our model from the natural to the socio-economic to the integrated management. So starting with the, with the natural, we, at the beginning, as we all remember, that we put the, our habitats, what we have habitats in the MPA. So in the Saloum MPA, which is located in Egypt, we have sandy beaches, seagrass, and seagrass beds, and the rocky coasts. Uh, so I will move uh, quickly about the natural and the socio-economic and constraint a little more about the, the, what we did today, which is the integrated management. So after choosing the habitats, we did the, the pro provision and the regular, oh no, it's the provisions in, yeah, here. The provisions and the provision uh, ecosystem benefits and the regulating and the cultural. Uh, from the natural to the socio-economic, then the, from the socio-economics we had the primary benefits and the secondary, and uh, overall the community benefits. Where we're in the, uh, sorry, from the Saloum MPA, what we have the local economy improvement, continuity of maritime heritage, and wealth distri uh, distribution, and the increased knowledge after uh, doing the socio-economic uh, model. So now when we come to the integrated management, uh, the first uh, title was the desi designing MPAs for results. What we did is the zonation, zoning for access for fisheries, for fishers. So we make a, a new zone, we, they, they, they did a new zone for the MPA uh, to, like, to let the fishermen or the fisherwomen to benefit from fishing outside the, the MPA. Uh, also, we did the zoning for the fisheries uh, replenishment, which is inside the MPA, where with the zonation uh, get benefits for the fish, uh, nursery, and shelter. For the managing MPAs for uh, conservation and sustainable development, we did a no-take zone to enhance fishing outside the MPA, as I said before, and the cooperative monitoring with fishers. For the removing barriers to access for local communities, more communication with the uh, local communities, with people aside, military, more communication like talking friendly, uh, giving advice just to gain or to benefit uh, from having the, the trust. 
Uh, the second thing was local communities job opportunities. How we let the local communities to engage with uh, the MPA management and to help us was by lo uh, finding their jobs, such as the uh, land-based rangers. So they help us with monitoring and these stuff. Moreover, like we did, uh, they did workshops uh, for local community to exchange knowledge. So all the community will be integrated while we are doing an MPA. Last. Uh, supporting livelihood uh, diversification and enhancement as like uh, job opportunities such as rangers and modern fishing uh, technology and techniques. Ahmed, you want to do this? I continue. Thank you. Uh, and for the uh, MBA uh, co-management, uh, uh, the Saloum protected area located in Egypt, uh, it's a belong to a ministry of environment in the top of the uh, 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 MBA. And then uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, ministry of agriculture, okay, with a cooperation with the co collaborate with the ministry of environment. And we have a military uh, in Saloum. Uh, the uh, guard of uh, coast and the uh, guard of uh, borders. Uh, they are uh, from them. We have MBA management uh, uh, team. Uh, we have to inform the fisher and local community with the uh, uh, you know law of the MBA and the uh, uh, process. And we have to uh, consult the military and uh, we have to local community uh, and NGOs. Uh, and uh, an institute for uh, marine science in Alexandria, the nearest uh, city, okay? And uh, to, uh, to make uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, uh, for the uh, uh, co-management uh, for the uh, MBA, we have a fisherman, we have a, uh, for the, uh, and fisherwoman for the uh, uh, um, monitoring. We have army for, uh, uh, enforcement of the law. We have uh, uh, Institute for Mani Marine uh, Science for research and monitoring. We have students as a volunteer, uh, NGO uh, for the product of the local community, and we have the local community uh, as uh, 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 general, uh, general management and maybe for uh, working as a, a guard. The co-management, yes, that's cool. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you very much. That, that's fantastic. If you remember, this was a very unusual MPA without really any collaboration in its management. So this new design would be quite a big change. It would be great if it could happen. But now we want the other two teams to comment on this design. If you had, if you were the manager or the team that was looking at this particular set of uh, natural and social capital with these various um, uh, arrangements for management, would you, is this the way you would design it? How does it compare with your, the, the MPA you were working on? So we want some input from the other two teams. Okay, so any feedback then? So who would like to comment first? Palm Island or Al Hosima? <laughs> <laughs> Both very different. It's good. We have three very different MPAs. So. I see that you put also the, the inform, no? And they, they consult, no? This is what you think is more more feasible, no? The, for for this for your so so for me having seen all three one noticeable difference is they're not thinking about a cooperative uh, co-management stakeholder committee which what do some of the other teams who have that process feel do they think this do you think this will work without a our committee. Does anyone want to comment on that? Well, the committee is there. The, the, the lower part is actually yeah. stakeholder cooperation, which is a future, yeah. future. Ah, uh, it will be a future, future, future committee. committee. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's good. So because they need the acceptance of the Ministry of Environment. If she accept, it accept the co-management uh, 
Right. So okay. from, from uh, four existing partners in the management now, we are going, moving to six uh, mm -hmm. uh, new partners who are going to be co-managers of the site. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Ali? First of all, okay. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, with this, with this organigram who is proposed as a, as a suggestion, if there is a project of law who can facilitate uh, the, the constitution or the or the, the execution of this of this proposition, or the committee and the, all the stakeholders, maybe uh, I don't know if there is a if there is a reflection about what what we have as a laws in in the, in the context of Libya. Uh, prepared or projects of law uh, who, who can facilitate the, the implementation of this committee? Yeah, um, I think according to the existing law, this is in Egypt, by the way, and uh, according to existing law, this, um, this structure will be still uh, led by the Ministry of Environment because the, this is the ministry who will give the legal mandate to, uh, to lead and manage the uh, protected area. And this is not a change of uh, the vertical structure of management, but actually increase the vertical, the horizontal uh, uh, axis of management to include other stakeholders, which is trying to enforce the idea of co-management. So the manager is still the, the Ministry of Environment, but uh, the idea was to increase the uh, partners as a co-managers. Uh, of course, in the law, right now it's not existing, that's why we said in the, our discussions, the first thing should come from the uh, existing manager of the, of the MBA to talk to his, with his ministry, introducing the topic of co-management and uh, trying to have it as a policy, maybe not as in the law, because the law process will take a long time for the parliament to adopt it and everything. But even uh, a minister decree can be uh, built on to engage uh, or to uh, introduce the concept of co-management. And uh, I was telling my team that in order to convince the minister to uh, have this step, you have to tell him that uh, uh, the future projects funding and also contacts with the international uh, donors will be more facilitated if we take this step, because this will uh, tell the donors that our Management is not top-down central management, uh, but it's also decentralized to include uh, nearby stakeholders in the MPA. Thank you. Hello. No, no, it's okay. I uh, I have the, the ah, answer oh. in the. Okay, question. so yeah, it's solve it's the okay. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> the you. comment. Okay. No, no, thank no, you very no. much. Are there any further questions or comments to comments to to this model? No. Okay, so then, Anne, do you have any comment? But well, you were with this group, so you already. <laughs> yes? Just a petit commentaire. Donc, c'est une gouvernance descendante et pas ascendante. Donc, tout ce qui est descendant, il devient imposé, non concerté. Donc, il faut, à mon avis, l'opération soit de sens inverse, soit de, 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 de la base vers le haut pour qu'on puisse, euh, pour que, -dire, il faut qu'il soit, euh, comment dirais-je, inclusive. La démarche, il faut qu'elle soit inclusive. Sinon, comme ça, c'est une dictature. Donc, on l'impose d'en haut en bas, à mon avis, à mon sens. Donc, c'est bien à ce qu'il soit concerté dans un comité local et puis dans un comité euh, central interministériel. Merci. Very good point. I mean, and this is actually... Uh what I was talking to Anne before, I mean, the more we are trying to convince existing solid governments of uh, involving local communities and making co-management, it might be good, but it might be misunderstood. Why? Because as you said, the word dictatorship, and dictatorship doesn't mean that you, the president is military. Yeah? It can be a, a civilian president, but he's a dictator. So we, are, we have to deal with the existing, trying to change it a little bit. Because uh, otherwise, the system is very rigid, not only in Egypt, but in all North African countries, including my and your country. And the idea of democratic movement and uh, uh, lobbying people to press on the government to make it bottom-up process is really not feasible anywhere in the Mediterranean. 
including North Mediterranean, North Mediterranean, I'm sure. Not in Italy, not in Greece, not in Turkey, for sure. So, so we have to introduce what, what we are here trying to do is not to change the mindset of the government, but only to introduce a new concept on the scientific basis. We are not looking for a political change. We are looking for management change for MPA. We don't care about the structure of the government or, the, or who's ruling the country. No, we are, we are care about the small republic of the MPA, not the big republic of the country. So that's why uh, uh, what you said is right, but not in the Arab world. Thank you. It's right, but not here. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe See. Canada, New Zealand, maybe. Maybe not in the States. But, but often with the, it's a really good point, but often to start, if you don't have this approach already and if the legal system doesn't endorse it and support it, you have to start, and you are actually starting at the bottom because you're starting down here in the MPA and you're just introducing this idea of collaboration and then you educate everybody and then people start to see and then eventually, hopefully, uh, you know, at the ministerial level, they'll start to understand. They'll see that that MPA perhaps is working better than some of the others. So, so you work on a pilot basis. So at some level, it, it is a sort of uh, bottom, bottom up, bottom, a very quiet bottom up approach. <laughs> okay, should we go to who's going to go next? We want to fit. Both groups have to present. Who will go next? Yes. Yeah. Can you bring your charts? <laughs> euh, bonjour tout le monde. Vous m'entendez Vous m'entendez bien Ok. Alors bonjour tout le monde. On a préparé euh, notre travail de la manière euh, de la manière suivante. Alors euh, après tout, comme, euh, comme nous le savons tous, alors les aires marins protégées sont créées pour protéger et conserver. Euh, des exemples représentatifs, euh, euh, des exemples représentatifs euh, de, de la richesse euh, marine. Alors euh, pendant les, les trois jours de formation, on a commencé par l'identification de la partie de la partie marine de notre aire protégée du parc national de Huslima. Après, on a procédé à l'identification euh, des espèces euh, clés euh, qui qui se sont associés à des, à des habitats clés, ainsi que les écosystèmes. Euh, donc, parmi ces espèces clés, on a cité le balbuzard pêcheur, euh, poulpe, euh, donc euh, le corail, euh, etc. Donc, euh, en ce qui concerne, donc pour la partie qui concerne euh, la, geste, la planification de la gestion des aires marins protégées. Alors, euh, euh, principalement, la conception des aires marins protégées en fonction des résultats. Alors, on a procédé à l'installation des nautic zones euh, en concertation avec les pêcheurs en tant euh, qu'usagères. Ensuite, euh, on a fait des actions de développement lo local pour la population locale pour euh, tirer profit euh, des services euh, écosystémiques. Pour la gestion des aires marins protégées pour la conservation et la durabilité, alors, euh, euh, donc, euh, il y a la sensibilisation qui... Euh, euh, alors, euh, 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 typiquement, euh, l'éducation environnementale, euh, l'aménagement de l'infrastructure euh, écotouristique et l'infrastructure de gestion comme l'observatoire euh, et, et l'écomusée. Alors, ce sont deux centres euh, euh, d'accueil euh, qui, qui mettent en valeur euh, euh, alors, les composantes de l'air marine protégée euh, et aussi des éco-gardes pour, pour le suivi. Alors, pour euh, éliminer les obstacles à l'accès pour les communautés locales, on a euh, procédé aux prises en compte euh, du zonage. Alors, il y a des, des, des zones intégrales euh, où euh, donc, euh, et, seulement la recherche scientifique est autorisée et aussi la subvention des AGR et des, et des, donc, des actions génératrices de revenus et des compétences de la mise en défense pour, euh, pour atténuer euh, l'effet euh, abusif de, de, de l'utilisation de, de l'espace marine. Alors pour soutenir la, divers, la diversification et l'amélioration des moyens de subsistance, alors euh, il y a comme activité l'accompagnement euh, des pêcheurs dans des autres activités autres que la pêche comme le pescatourisme, la plaisance, euh, etc. Alors aussi la formation euh, des guides nature et euh, des sports nautique. Euh, 
Alors concernant la cogestion, alors il est chapeauté par euh, la ministère de l'Agriculture, dont il relève l'Agence nationale des eaux et forêts et euh, le département de la pêche maritime. Alors euh, ces deux organes euh, travaillent dans le cadre d'une commission technique euh, ou bien présidée par une commission technique euh, des aires protégées. Euh, pour, concernant la gestion, elle est assurée par euh, la direction du parc, alors euh, qui assure la conservation et suivi écologique, partenariat et développement durable, l'accueil et euh, l'animation la, nature et l'écotourisme, aussi euh, le système d'information géographique et finalement la programmation et gestion administrative. Ainsi, alors cette gestion est, est, est assurée par des, des, des éco-gardes. Alors pour moi l'éco-gestion est une technique qui permet la gestion en commun par les différentes parties prenantes afin d'assurer afin d'assurer le partage des, des connaissances etc. Merci. Merci Khadija. Vraiment, tu as présenté fidèlement un peu ce qu'on a fait. Bravo. Mais juste pour compléter surtout cet, as sur cet aspect un peu co-management, euh, euh, ce qu'on a présenté ici, c'est un peu, peu l'état des lieux actuels par rapport au contexte du Maroc, au point de vue euh, gouvernance. Donc comme on l'a dit auparavant, euh, euh, au niveau national, on, on a essayé de créer un comité, euh, c'est créé déjà un comité, une commission technique des aires protégées, dont, euh, qui réunit un peu l'ensemble des partenaires et des administrations qui sont concernés, en plus d'un comité scientifique, et qui valide un peu tout ce qui est en relation aux aires protégées, soit terrestres ou marins, classement, reclassement, les aspects scientifiques et tout. Et de, cette, de cet organigramme sort un organe de gestion qui est composé de, quatre, de, 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 de cinq unités. Donc c'est un peu le programme qui est proposé déjà dans l'organigramme, pour, euh, pour sa mise en œuvre. Donc tout ce qui est recrutement pour le personnel de l'organe de gestion, il doit, il doit un peu être euh, inculqué dans ces, 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 ces unités. Conservation écologique, partenariat, animation écotourisme, système d'information et programmation. Et bien sûr, il y a des éco-gardes et tout cela, tout cela est stipulé dans, le, dans la loi qui est déjà sortie, qui prévoit aussi la désignation des éco-gardes qui sont certifiés pour faire le suivi. Mais en, en parallèle à cela, il y a toujours d'autres formes de gestion qui sont déjà appliquées sur, euh, au niveau national. On a des exemples, par exemple, de, comme le centre de réhabilitation des vautours ou bien l'observatoire, et sont gérés d'une manière de, de cogestion avec des conventions, avec des partenaires. Ça veut dire qu'en parlant de, de, de cogestion, on a l'aspect un peu interne qui est organe de gestion, mais il y a d'autres aspects de gestion qui, qui peuvent être utilisés et testés, comme des cogestions, comme le cas du Medfund, euh, auquel, on, auquel on, on, on travaille actuellement. Public privé, voilà. Tout, et tout cela, ça rentre dans le partenaire public privé. Pourquoi on a cité le partenaire public privé Parce qu'on a des exemples d'infrastructures qui sont, qui sont euh, aménagées et construites. Par exemple, si on parle de l'UQ Musée d'El de, de, il y a une partie euh, service, restauration, accueil du public. Et, et, et c'est un, un créneau qu'on trouve très adéquat pour, pour s'ouvrir au, au, au public, au privé. Des investisseurs ils peuvent être intéressés à gérer le site. Comme ça, l'administration est garantie à que le site soit, soit, soit géré, soit contrôlé. Et en même temps, ça peut générer de l'argent pour, pour, le, pour le, 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 les investisseurs. Merci. Merci. Je voudrais juste poser une question, peut-être, pour être sûr que nous sommes tous clairs dans la salle. This, this sounds very much like the structure, if I understand, the structure you have broadly at the moment or are planning to put in place. And, and I was just wanting to ask you, so that means basically do you think this is the structure that would work at the site? And so is your main stage now to implement it? The main yeah. challenge is yeah. the implementation. Uh, c'est un, un peu le, le une structure qui ne résulte pas un peu de l'expérience passée parce qu'il y avait des, des expériences qui ont été testées. Et on a vu, c'est un peu le, 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 le scénario qui, pam, qui peut marcher le plus, mais en parallèle avec, euh, avec des lois qui, aussi, qui ont sorti. C'est pourquoi tout à l'heure j'ai parlé sur la question des lois, parce que c'est important pour mettre en œuvre tout cela. Maintenant, on a des textes d'application de lois qui sont sortis, euh, et on peut mettre en œuvre concrètement sur le terrain ces aspects-là. Ça veut dire, l'intéressant pour nous, parce que comme je le dis euh, hier, avec la stratégie des eaux forêts, on table que les aires protégées, nos aires protégées soient vraiment aménagées 
Parce que lorsqu'on dit valorisation des parcs, il faut d'abord euh, miser sur l'infrastructure, sur l'aménagement de nos parcs. Et pour cela, on, on a proposé un organigramme qui soit vraiment adéquat pour que le parc soit autonome. Parce que l'idée, c'est d'avoir des parcs autonomes avec un financement adéquat, soit des ministères, mais aussi des bailleurs de fonds. C'est pour cela que j'ai dit hier, il y avait des bailleurs de fonds qui vont nous appuyer sur ce processus. Économie bleue, euh, Banque africaine, Union européenne, euh, l'AFD. Ce sont tous des parcs. D'ailleurs, l'AFD actuellement est travaillé avec nous sur le parc d'Ivraine avec tout ce qui est infrastructure écotouristique. Pour, 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 euh, et et l'idée, c'est qu'on est conscient que conserver, mais avec la valorisation. Il doit être là. Donc, il faut préparer le terrain euh, en matière d'infrastructure. Et ce mécanisme-là, on a vu qu'en parallèle à ce mécanisme, ça serait toujours intéressant de, de continuer dans des, des, dans des, des modèles de cogestion. On a testé actuellement le, le modèle de cogestion du Medfund. Il y a des modèles de convention, de gestion déléguée, parce que la loi, elle le permet. Notre loi, elle permet de déléguer la gestion à, euh, dans une tâche donnée. On l'a dit tout à l'heure, question des responsabilités. Il ne faut pas tout donner peut-être aux, aux partenaires, surtout les ONG, mais il y a certains aspects de gestion qui peuvent être délégués facilement. Je vous donne l'exemple du conservatoire de, 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 du centre de réhabilitation des Boutours. C'est un centre qui a été construit par les euphorés, investissement et tout. Mais la, sa gestion, elle est, elle est déléguée à, à une organisation euh, qui, est intéressée, qui, qui fait le bord droit de l'ornithologie, qui est Grépom. Donc c'est leur métier, mais c'est toujours sous forme de convention. Ça veut dire que ça peut très bien marcher, il faut juste avoir le cadre légal. Et une chose importante que, que je voulais partager, c'est que lorsqu'on valide un plan d'aménagement des, des gestions, dans cette loi, il va devenir opposable par la loi. Et c'est intéressant, parce qu'avant, on faisait des plans d'aménagement pour les, les aires protégées ou pour n'importe quel aspect, on peut réunir les gens, on peut parler avec eux des, des, des différentes institutions, on valide un plan d'action, mais il n'est pas opposable pour eux, parce qu'il n'y a pas une loi qui est derrière. Mais lorsqu'on a, euh, lorsque la loi le, 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 euh, est figurée dans la loi que le, le, le plan d'aménagement sera opposable, dans ce cas, toutes les administrations ils seront tenues de, de le faire respecter et ça, de, ça devient un, un outil de travail pour tout le monde. Je peux rajouter quelques éléments. Donc, nous avons deux, deux types de, de, de cogestion. Une cogestion avec les ONG qui n'est pas euh, donc qui n'est pas à but euh, lucratif en premier lieu, mais il y a une autre une autre un autre type de, de, de gestion déléguée avec les le partenariats public privé. Donc, on délègue les, les activités qu'on ne peut pas récolter les, les recettes. Donc, on a un certain nombre, de, maintenant, un certain nombre d'activités et de, de services à offrir euh, au grand public et qu'on délègue au, au privé et euh, contre une redevance, en contrepartie, une redevance annuelle. Elle paye, elle paye un, une redevance annuelle au, au département ou bien à l'AMP. Oh aux, aux, aux forêts et eux, ils, ils prennent bénéfice de, de l'activité. Par exemple, on a des, des tyroliens, des, des balades des cimes dans, des, dans les musées On a un musée marin, un musée marin au sein de l'observatoire qui sera, qui sera peut-être payé contre un ticket, on va faire des tickets et tout. Et je voudrais souligner, souligner aussi que ce n'est pas, ce modèle, ce n'est pas un top bottom. Donc pour l'élaboration de la stratégie, plusieurs, il y a un, un top bottom et bottom top. Donc on descend jusqu'à jusqu'en bas et on, on cherche qu'est-ce qu'on les, les contraintes et il y a des études qui se font euh, d'abord avec les parties concernées avant de, 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 de faire sortir le modèle, tous ces organes de gestion euh, de, qui, qui viennent avec la, 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 la nouvelle stratégie et tout. Donc euh, voilà. Yes, so any of the other two teams like to comment on this? This is a, a, a very different MPA again. Uh, Are there any lessons learned from this that you could apply at your site? Or do you think some of the things you're doing at your MPAs would actually benefit this one? Everybody's running out of steam. 
Just some ideas, some thoughts. Anybody want to add anything to this? It's so clear and so perfect. <laughs> Do you want to add anything, Anne? Okay, so we go to the, we'll go to the, yeah, we'll go the, to the next one. group then. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the last one. A lot of um, uh, services like food uh, or um, climate indicator, um, historic and, uh, and the cultural heritage, um, and the climate indicator again. And this service um, have a species um, provided this service, <laughs> like, uh, like fish, turtle, crabs, tramp, uh, mollusk, uh, pirds, just it, um, as like in this uh, diagram. And thank you. <laughs> and now we will talk about uh, activities um, happened when we use this uh, habitats. Okay, so, uh, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you. We defined uh, the socio-economic capital as uh, de uh, depends on our uh, colleagues from Lebanon. So this structure defines the uh, socio-economic uh, capital. Uh, the activities was uh, beach visitors and recreation, diving, sport fishing. The primary benefits was the boat owners, diving clubs, owners of sport fishing. The secondary benefits was uh, gas stations, markets of, uh, and taxis, hotels and restaurant. All these are the primary and secondary benefits. Now the... Um, Hello. I don't know what to say, but in order to manage your MPA, you need to design the area into zones, I guess, temporal zone. In this zone, sometimes you close seasonally and then you close it to protect the birds and turtle nests. When you close it, you need alternation zones. So you change uh, into maybe per six months open, six months closed. I don't know exactly. And you also need to put mooring system to design MPA, to avoid anchoring for sea beds, seagrass. Also, you need to define core transition, core and transitional and buffer zones. Also, you need to manage the impacts from livelihoods to give the fishermen or the other people some kind of permits or improve the regulation, improve education or put some awareness into them. How is it possible? I don't know. Putting awareness into someone. Uh, so also you need to remove the barriers to build the capacity. In order to do that, you need to establish some training courses from national or regional experts. Also change the policy or improve the policy that supports the livelihoods. And you also you need to open up the possibility for the for new economics. So the fishermen or the, the other captains change into fishermen or the fishermen may become another maybe dive boat owner or something so that they will not die because of not doing any job, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, here, uh, the local situation, uh, the MPA committee is between, uh, is under the Ministry of Environment and coordinate with many, many uh, other ministry, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Transport, uh, Ministry of Interior. Uh, so, and uh, we have the team of the MPA committee, expert in marine, expert uh, agriculture expert, and the president most of time is the mayor of, uh, or the president of the, min the municipality of the area, and uh, some representative of some NGO. Under the, uh, the team of the committee are the manager, the finance team, the ranger, etc. 
so what we are looking for and uh, uh, based on the real situation in Lebanon, we think that decentralization is one of the best idea uh, to, to, uh, to, to increase the capacity uh, of the MPA committee. So uh, MPA should be under directly the municipality, which will be the local governance, governance and the uh, member will be changed uh, to, uh, to be represented by, by some fishermen. All stakeholders should be uh, uh, involved to be in the committee from local, from local community, from many experts, and uh, the situation under st uh, will be the same for the finance, the manager, etc. So we think that decentralization, like in uh, France, they have many important uh, success by the decentralization. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, you. Yes, uh, just uh, something like to share with you. Uh, here, this concept is what we call it the concepts of Hima. Hima is the new term. Uh, we choose it in Lebanon, in fact. So because the, the regulation and the decision was taken directly by the municipality. Okay, so in general, MPA, we should have a Ministry of Environment. So that should be. So this is really virtual, something that we hope that it will happen, but it never happen. So also my colleague Simon agree on it. So here, yeah. So here, there should be a Ministry of Environment somewhere because it's a, that is the concept of Hima, and it is present in the law of the Lebanese, uh, let's say, regulation and everything. That's the point. Yeah. So. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Which are the advantages of decentralization uh, regarding to the model, the new model from the old model? So I will let my colleague Simon because yeah. decentralization yes. is. <laughs> Uh, what's the question? What are the advantages of decentralization? So the new model from the older model that one you have now? Uh, and uh, first of all, any decisions that the committee want to, to, to put on the field, they, sh they should return to the ministry. So, uh, you know, the, govern the local governance is present in Beirut, uh, in other area, so they don't have a direct contact with the local com also they do not know anything about the local co committees uh, uh, the stakeholder no zero contact between the area and the ministry except in the paper so the local community uh, the local com uh, the, the municipality of the local governance know everything about the area no have a contact with uh, a fishermen cooperative with uh, stakeholder, all stakeholders so uh, that there will be a direct contact between them and the direct contact will increase the benefit for uh, mpa and for the governance of the mpa okay thank you um do we have um Comments from the other teams? Any comments, feedback? You want to say something? Uh, I know. Yeah. I, I think that's great to have a really radical suggestion made because this is a, an ideal situation and it's always good. You say it may never happen. We don't know what but will maybe happen. Maybe it can be. It maybe. should be happening. Always, we, what we are looking for we know that the, the situation in Lebanon will stay for five, ten, twenty years, yes. the same situation. So why uh, we are looking for something that uh, to, to do something uh, to, to make one step? Let's do when we want to make a change, we should make a real change, not one step change, ten steps st change. That's right. So it's always good to have that great vision of what you really want and to know what that vision is. Okay. If okay, and. Yeah. Uh, you should give government to that also to the municipality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. De decentralization, which uh, many people. Yeah. Okay. Any more comments? Oh, good. En français, juste pour. Okay. Euh, non, euh, ça m'a interpellé cette question de la décentralisation. C'est très important comme, comme, comme sujet parce que effectivement, euh, pour l'exemple du Maroc, on a effectivement cette question de décentralisation qui s'impose maintenant parce qu'on a les régions avancées. Maintenant, les, les régions, ils ont plus de pouvoir. 
c'est dans le cadre de l'autonomie de, de, des attributions. Et ce qui fait, euh, dans la région, on a le conseil régional, par exemple, de Tangier Tito al Hussima, auquel relève al Hussima Park et, et Jbel Moussa. Le conseil régional, maintenant, il a, des, il a des attributions qui sont plus fortes, ils ont des financements, ils peuvent financer même des actions, et parmi leurs attributions, ils peuvent intervenir dans les aires protégées. Sensibilisation, des actions d'accompagnement, et actuellement, euh, euh, donc, on est très, très, très sollicité par eux pour proposer des actions, ils peuvent financer, ils peuvent avoir un, un, un plus de, dans tout cela. Aussi, euh, en même temps, en parallèle, euh, il y a un travail, le, le, même au niveau du ministère, euh, pour s'aligner avec, avec les, les attributions des conseils régionaux, il faut que les, les responsables régionaux, les, diri les directeurs régionaux soient en ligne d'avoir de, de, les attributions nécessaires pour, pour activer un peu, parce qu'il y a des, 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 des actions d'investissement, on peut avoir des, des lourdeurs administratives, et c'est à partir de, du début de l'année prochaine, même les directeurs régionaux, ils auront la plupart des attributions qui ont été au central. C'est un peu pour s'aligner dans, dans la région avancée, et je crois aussi que c'est un mécanisme de gouvernance qui peut être très fort pour, pour faciliter un peu l'exécution des actions et des financements. Je uh, peux, uh, I can say something. Also, f f for the sustainability of MPA in terms of finance, when we have decentralization, we have more money. Of course, because uh, you know, money go to the Ministry of Finance and zero return to the MP zero return to the municipality also. So zero return to the MPA. Uh, I can give you an example uh, for hunting in Lebanon. Before uh, you should have a permit, uh, permit us. Uh, permit, uh, to, but zero uh, money come to the Ministry of, uh, of Environment. All money go to other uh, ministry. So when we have decentralization, uh, who will pay for the municipality of each uh, activity in sea or uh, at the coastal area, can uh, some of the budget can return to the MPA management, uh, etc., or to the uh, finance, uh, to the box finance in MPA management? Euh, comité. Mais euh, je, pense, je pense comme ça, vous serez euh, tributaire au financement euh, étranger euh, par rapport au fonctionnement de, de, de la marine protégée à long terme. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas de, de financement international Est-ce que la municipalité peut toujours pérenniser le, les services écosystémiques et au moins euh, pour faire bénéficier le, la collectivité ayant euh, cautionné la démarche de, du classement de l'air marine protégé dont je salue euh, votre courage et votre, euh, votre travail. C'est une question. C'est une question. C'est une question, non Non, c'est un commentaire ou une question oui. Bon, oui, parce que... Oui. Ah oui, 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 j'ai compris, mais du coup, c'est pour cela, <rire> oui, parce que c'est pour cela on a parlé de <rire> décentralisation, là, c'est-à-dire que là, à un certain moment, on sera indépendant, donc on aura plus de fonds. C'est ce que mon collègue, sa mère, vient de commenter, en fait, il disant que on pense à la sustainabilité du, des actions. Donc, euh, du point de vue des centralisations, euh, ça va nous aider énormément. Donc, on n'aura plus besoin... Oh, oui, on aura toujours besoin des projets, disons, européens, ou bien internationaux, ou bien régionaux. Mais là, vu que tout est correct, ben là, ça, c'est l'idée la plus correcte pour le, pour le Liban. Moi, pour moi, je suis quelqu'un qui vient du gouvernement. Je, je n'accepte pas que le ministère de l'Environnement ne soit pas là. Donc, pour moi, je suis pour que le, le, ministre, le ministère de l'Environnement soit là. Mais en général, là, c'est l'idée, c'est le concept vraiment idéal pour une, M, pour une AMP au Liban. Donc, euh, voilà. Je ne sais pas. Ah, oui. Oui, 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 bien sûr, parce que déjà, du coup, euh, la municipalité, ça c'est un terme qu'on ne peut pas changer, le président de la municipalité, c'est lui le président, le chef, en fait, en général, qui gère toutes les activités dans, le, dans, dans cette municipalité, donc inclut la réserve, donc la réserve, elle est une partie de cette municipalité, c'est ça l'idée. Donc une fois que même la municipalité aura des, des fonds ou bien d'autres euh, aides ou bien supports, certainement il y aura un pourcentage là euh, revenant à des... Ben, des parties, surveillance, écosystème, autre chose. Donc, euh, dans, dans ce, je répète en disant que ce cas, 
C'est quelque chose vraiment qu'on qu voilà, qu 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 essaie de voir, d'avoir, mais du coup, euh, ouais, c'est quelque chose d'irréel. Hein. Ouais. Ouais. Ouais, je, ouais, je, je suis libanais purement. Pour, 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 pour. <rire> Non, je crois que c'est une question de décentralisation. Quand on parle de communes, je crois qu'on n'est pas, c'est pas un choix à faire. C'est une, une obligation parce que lorsqu'on parle de l'approche territoriale intégrée, c'est un choix. Il faut passer par les communes territoriales. Par exemple, au Maroc, lorsqu'on descend à un niveau commune territoriale, c'est le président de la commune qui, qui est le responsable de la gestion de son territoire. Même les actions, par exemple, si je prends un exemple euh, pour, pour nous, les, les forestiers, si on coupe, par exemple, un, un boisement dans un cadre d'une adjudication, la grande partie des fonds, ils il passent à la commune pour, pour, le, pour le, le, le développement local. Ce qui fait donc la et, 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 et aussi plus que cela, il y a des projets d'investissement forestier qui doivent être validés par la commune, de, le, ce qu'on appelle délibération com communale. Ça veut dire, lorsqu'on parle de décentralisation, il faut au contraire penser à intégrer, et, et raison de plus qu'actuellement, par exemple, pour le cas du Maroc, ils ont plus de poids, il y a une région qui, qui est forte, ils ont des financements autonomes, et, et ils ont même des attributions fortes, donc on est, on est obligé de passer à travers eux dans des comités qui doivent être intégrés, et au contraire, ils peuvent beaucoup aider, parce qu'ils ont aussi un poids électoral, ils ont une influence sur, le, 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 sur la population locale, ils peuvent, des fois, ils peuvent, eux, nous faciliter la tâche vis-à-vis -vis de, de, de certains projets. Oui, oui, du point de vue, cette histoire de décentralisation, en plus, elle va changer énormément, même la façon qu'on va communiquer avec d'autres organisations du point de vue euh, régional ou bien méditerranéen, attention, parce qu'à un certain moment, là, on est en train d'annuler une grande partie, là, parce que, du coup, le point focal de certaines organisations, nous savons tous que c'est le ministère de l'Environnement, donc, euh, ouais. une fois qu'on aura cette décentralisation, ça, pour répondre en plus à la question, on sera vraiment, à un certain moment, peut-être indépendant, disons, 70% ou bien 60% indépendant, voilà, ouais, c'est très très bien. I just want to make sure everyone else has a chance to comment. So, oh, so I just, I, there's two questions I'd like to ask of each of the three groups. And that is, the first one is, um, when you get to, we've, we've developed a model. And so there's sort of pieces of a model. And if you're not very careful, each of those pieces can get what we call stovepiped. You can look at them as separate pieces rather than as a whole part of the model that we're creating. But I just want to be sure that when you get to the management part of the model, and by the management I mean both your management plans, your management actions, and your management, your co-management model, are they, if you look at them backwards, when, when I put together models, I always try and create them and build the model, but then also test the model by taking it backwards and seeing if it still holds together or not. So if you were to start with your management framework, integrated management framework, the two pieces that we looked at, does it, if you went backwards, does it continue to support the rest of the model that you build? And I think it's really important to check your work because sometimes we get really caught up, particularly in the end, putting a management plan together or creating a management framework. We get so, so focused on that that we lose track that the whole purpose of that is to enhance the value of our natural capital and our social capital. So my question is, after having said all that, do you, each of the three groups, feel like your model still holds together in that your whole management model really truly supports the protection of your natural capital and your social capital? Is it really focused on that? Or did it kind of move away and start to focus on just looking like a good management model? Any, any responses to that? It's kind of a question. So, <laughs> so yeah. Because, do you understand what I'm saying? That it's really, 
um, we're trying to create the perfect management model and it's like, oh yeah, what we're really trying to do is not create a perfect management model. What we're really trying to do is to protect our natural capital and our social capital. Does that model still do that? Uh, pour moi, je crois que le modèle, bon, on le voit comme ça uh, pour notre, notre groupe, ou bien pour, pour nous en tant que, que pays, on le voit comme un modèle adéquat qui peut résoudre les, 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 les problèmes auxquels fait, fait face l'air marine protégée. Mais ça reste, ça reste bien sûr insuffisant. On n'est pas sûr ça, est ce que ça va atteindre les résultats auxquels on est escompté. Pourquoi Parce que il y a déjà, il y a déjà des, des facteurs et, qui influencent l'air marine protégée auxquels on n'a pas un peu la main. On part, partant déjà de, de la question des changements climatiques, des changements rapides qui se passent sur les airs marines on peut pas, on n'a pas un peu l'accent sur ça. Il y a aussi, euh, malgré si on a toutes les lois qui sont là, euh, on a toutes les comités, euh, les, les comités qui sont installés, mais est-ce qu'on est sûr d'avoir un peu l'engagement de, de toutes les parties prenantes pour, pour réaliser les actions Question de financement aussi, certainement, il y aura des, il y aura des actions qui, auront, qui seront tributaires d'un financement donné. Est-ce qu'on on, on va l'avoir à temps Est-ce qu'on va l'avoir avec la quantité qu'on veut et dans notre temps escompté Parce que lorsqu'on parle naturel, c'est un processus qui ne va pas nous attendre. C'est des changements rapides avec, le, avec, c est, c est un peu, euh, avec les changements climatiques, c'est accentué. Donc, euh, chaque fois qu'on perd du temps, ça devient plus aggravé. Il y a aussi des risques naturels, des incendies de forêt. Donc, on n'est pas toujours sûr d'avoir répondu à notre, à, notre, à notre mission. So, that's a really good um, case in point. Why don't you wait to do that? Because I really want to talk about that still up there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, and in nobody's model, in the management piece, did you talk about adaptive management? And I think the example of Morocco is case in point, meaning that you just pointed out how there's so many variables. There's a dynamic and changing natural environment, particularly in regards to climate change. There's a dynamic and uh, changing uh, economic uh, framework that we're working under. And there's a dynamic and changing uh, governance at the national level that every country is working under every time. And that's just the, the top of the list of those variables. And so I think these considerations about are we really adding value to the protection of the natural resources? Are we really adding value to the, therefore, the protection of livelihoods? And are we willing to uh, continuously adapt? And how do we put that model in place if we're going to really do those things we say we're going to do over time? So I, I'm just, I guess I'm throwing it out there as food for thought, but I think it's really important to change is the theme that we're living under in MPAs in this, in this world that we're in right now. Are we willing and able to build into our management in order to do what we say we're going to do up there, the ability to continuously adapt and change? And that's almost, in some cases, it's almost a legal question. Could you put new regulations in place if you had to? Could you put a new monitoring program in place if you had to, to see what's, where kind of changes are taking place? So our management has to be equally dynamic to the changes that we're seeing around us. So I just, I'm just saying, it is, what is the added value of our MPAs? Are we really doing what we say we're going to do in reading the model backwards? And then how are we able to, this is great at this moment in time, but how are we continually going to be able to adapt to changes that are happening? So we know, we know what, just look at the last two, three years. On every level on this planet, everything has completely changed. Okay, so we have to do the same in MPAs. So, and if, we're, if our model's gonna work both backwards and forwards, there's gotta be a, the same dynamism to our, our model. So do you feel like you have that <laughs> and that, that really, truly we're going to be able to, to take on the responsibility that we say we are in bringing added value to, to the natural resources? Yeah. I think, Anne, you are taking us to a, a different level of, um, 
questions because why? Um, first of all, the co-management uh, and building a model is something new on the whole region of the Mediterranean, how to start building up a management model like this and how to insert the component of co-management. So the simple question, so simple answer for your question is that we need time and time will tell if the model is uh, uh, good enough or on the way we need to adapt it. So it should be flexible. I mean, the thing is, the thing of uh, uh, this model will be, should be different from uh, the old fashioned um, management schemes that used to be top down, uh, giving you a decree from the minister, including the composition of the management committee. So that's a rigid uh, system, which is <laughs> you struggle for uh, decades to uh, make it uh, functional on the ground. This uh, way of thinking from uh, bottom up uh, and linking the structure of the, uh, of the management committee to the goals of the MPA and to the um, objective of conserving the main habitats in the MPA is the success, is the, is the guarantee to not 100% success, but at least you, you pass. You pass the, the danger zone of failing uh, the, the model uh, functionality. So it needs time and also it needs to be adapted on the way. So it's like you are changing your wheels while you are driving. So it takes time to, to, uh, to get to the, to the function. So it's a testing thing. And you, you never know, maybe Anne after three years will come to you and say, oh, all of this is not right now. We are living in a changing world. I have another model for you. You never know. I, I just want to give you a quick little story of an experience that changed my life. And it's very, very quick. I was, I don't know, I don't remember when it was, about probably 10 years ago, maybe longer. I was invited to go to the state of California and for the natural resource management agencies at different levels, I was asked to put together a climate change training for them. And so, of course, my default was to, to ask all the scientists from the area to come and present their, inf the data they had on, on how the environment was changing. And, and so it was like, it was a week long, it was really complicated because of all these different agencies. And um, a woman was there from what's called Point Reyes Bird Obser Observatory. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They've been around for a long, long time. And she was the director. And I asked her to come speak about species interactions, um, uh, actually about the data I was telling you about today. And um, she turned around. She was giving a presentation. And she turned around to me and she said, you know, I think you have the notion that we're managing in the MPAs to keep things the way that we've always known them. She said, there's no way. You've been under an illusion. We can only manage for change. And things are never going to be the way that they were before. And she was ex exactly right. She blew my mind and completely changed everything about how I thought about what we were doing in MPAs. We're not managing to keep things as we know them today. We are trying to manage the change, right, and see, and see what of that change we can actually affect in some way, which is all about, you know, as whomever said it, I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 it was about we don't manage, we don't really manage the natural resources, we, we really manage human beings and their behavior, as Osman said the other day when she introduced, I think everybody was here at the time. And, but it's just this idea, I had this idea that, you know, we do, we do monitoring and, and populations and, and diversity and, you know, and we think like we're trying to keep it the same or better. And in fact, all we're doing is watching it change, right? So it's kind of like, okay, so how are we adapting our management to that then? And it, it just totally changed what I had thought I'd been doing for the previous 20 years, you know, it's like, Oh, you're, you're totally right. We're totally mistaken about what we're doing here. So, anyway. So, in other words, you are saying that the change is faster than our power to control? Or? Well, I'm, I'm saying that, that natural environments change all the time. They always have. And I'm not even talking about evolution. I'm just talking about we're working in a very dynamic environment. And so it's continuously changing. However, you know, we usually didn't see that change because it was very slow. But now, 10 years later or 15 years later, however long it's been since she said that, 
it's been accelerated. So we do see it now. There's no question from year to year who was talking about, um, Aisha was talking about the changes she's seen in seven years. You know, she's very young. You can imagine what Sue and I have seen um, over a 30, 40 years period. I mean, we're just like, it's not even, we don't even know what we're talking about anymore. So, <laughs> so well, I don't. <laughs> I probably never did. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, I have a question, in fact. Uh, so thank you, thank you for everything, so come on, especially. In fact, the management plan that we are doing, we are doing it for five years, no? That's it. Mm -hmm. And we try to update this kind of thing. So the model automatically will be updated after five years. That's the point. Yeah, so, that's standard. Yeah. yeah, so the kind of, let's say, how we adapt and everything, we should like take it after five years to think about it. So that's the point, no, or no? Yeah, I mean, it, and you know, because um, many management plans are, are within a government framework and governments move very slow to make changes. Mm. Five years is about as fast as you can expect a government to make a change. But you should be monitoring along the way, and as you get signals or pulses of something changing very rapidly, you're not going to wait five years to react to that, right? Mm. It may be too late if you're looking at something like uh, impacts that are causing coral bleaching other than climate change or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah. in, in fact, the, the MPAs in general are um, situated in, so I will put it like transparency, they put it in a region, no? So if there is like some change, uh, some let's say uh, significant change in some way, they will find a, a project about it, so it will be found about it. So today we are talking a lot of marine litter, you know? So there is a lot of project about marine litter. They are involved like MPAs on it. So we'll fight it together, that's the point. And other things, for example, now we are talking about uh, oil extraction, gas extraction. So it's like yeah. something. So they start to train like a lot of experts in the Mediterranean how to deal with uh, if you have that some oil spill accident or this kind of thing. So it will be like not more like let's say I don't know if it's correct or no. You you correct me just yeah. to answer. It's, it's not more related with um, only with MPA concerning this kind right. of adapt. It's more like, a, let's say, regional thing and regional stuff, no? That's the point. So. And that's why the Moroccan model is so good, because all the agencies sit together, and it allows you to respond accordingly. It may not be the MPA authority that responds, like if you had an oil spill or the sledge from the... Um, where was I? Oh, in Egypt, actually, where COP is going on right now, yeah. they're finding that the oil sledge from oil and gas development is impacting coral reefs in the Red Sea. I just read it yesterday. Um, and while COP is going on right down the road, right in Sharm el-Sheikh. And so the question is, who should be responding if it's in an MPA? And maybe it's not the MPA, but you should be coordinating with the other agencies and that's why the Morocco uh, model allows you to have that relationship already in place. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a real advantage of that. Okay, that, that was a really great discussion. I think probably, if that's all right, Anne, we move yeah. on. I just wanted to say on the adaptive management and all this change we're seeing, that's one of the first reasons you need a collaborative approach to management because you're going to get the information about change and your stakeholders are going to come and say, we need to change the management because the situation is changing. So I think there's a real value in, in looking at this collaborative approach, absolutely, because it's going to help you do adaptive management and adjust much more quickly to changes. Yeah, so it's a very good discussion. I just want to remind you, Patty's got a presentation to make, which is critical for tomorrow. So just before... Let's just stay with yeah, 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 we're not going to move. We're not going to move. But just, do you want to do the quiz there? Yeah, we do. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, so before, to get your brain cells working. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's only one last part, but it's very important for tomorrow. Um, maybe you can, if you can <laughs> clean this up. <laughs> Thank you. And... Um, I hope it works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Getting there, okay. So um, we have our quiz to <laughs> to have some energies. It will come soon. <laughs> I can say it. No, no worries. I can say it. Um, who made this statement yesterday? Attention. If you close an area for producing fish, there will be a lot of fish outside of the zone. So that's why I support it. Maybe you can read the French. Well, had a translation, so it's okay. Uh, okay, wait, wait, wait. Who say that? Who say that? The person. You have to say a name. A name of a person. Okay, no, no, one more one. Uh, but you need to say, you know, you have the name? Mohammed, 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 Mohammed,
this was meant uh, yeah, two years ago, this, this game. Out. So it says that also it provides a lot of job opportunities. That's another another thing that we can talk about. No, the job opportunities that provide also the the uh, things related to the ocean. For example, now everybody is talking about uh, so in the in the cities and uh, to have the robot. Uh, blue economy, all this, uh, to, uh, Barcelona, for example, wants to become the leader in blue economy <laughs> in Spain, this kind of thing. So it's giving a lot of also job opportunities. Um, this, is, uh, this is from the World Economic Forum, um, that they also, they talk um, about, um, actually about the fishing, about um, the, the, the fishing is unsustainable, and then they give some advice on how we can make it more sustainable. So this is a topic that is, has been already been discussing on the World Economic Forum. Um, we know all of this, so I will not get into details, but basically uh, managing, we need to manage these wild fisheries, so we need to create uh, marine protected areas that they are efficient. It doesn't say this straight away, but it says it there. Um, and then also it cites the case study, the Mediterranean, because the Mediterranean is historically the most overfished sea. Um, so here it says, however, no take marine reserves have proven effective in restoring marine biodiversity. So local economies increase tourism and the restoration of fish, fish production. So it's talking about the benefits of the NPS. This is um, just an example that we have heard about before. So take this into account tomorrow when you are um, talking about the, the benefits of your MPA in the future. So this is actually a model that they have done for the Medas Island. You know, the Medas Island is uh, these islands in, in Catalonia region. They are not so big, but they have been very successful, particularly with the tourism sector, with the dining industry. So they are providing a lot of benefits by protecting uh, their sources, uh, also with the fishing. Um, and then they have recovered the biomass up to 500%. They also uh, have stimulated the growth and uh, have created a lot of jobs in the region. Um, so then also it tells about that, this model about by year eight, the total annual profit for fishing and tourism will be um, 13 times higher than before. So this is really important to think about the long term or the benefits. So we are, you are, for example, your MPA, if you create a business plan, thinking more about the future, how it will be, and knowing how much you need to invest at the beginning and how much benefit you will have at the end. And this is what you can also sell to the, to the investors. And highlighting, this, highlighting the social and economic values of the MPAs, no? Uh, social and economic values of biodiversity can help to shift the perception of an MPA. So if we highlight this, and uh, establishing uh, establishment of a public expenditure for conservation. So if you are talking about we are talking about natural capital, so those this natural capital also to enhance that, no, as as the as a potential investment. So again, why invest in MPAs? We should you know think a lot about that. Um, so we know these things, but we need to know also how to communicate that in a simple, uh, more, well, in a language that uh, investors understand also. Uh, so they play an important role in uh, safeguard the ecosystem services. They play a role uh, supporting the climate resilience. They play a role in the climate mitigation, for example, through carbon sequestration. I think it has a lot of potential also in the Mediterranean. And they play an important role in the recovery of biodiversity and habitats, and they multiply the benefits across the sector in the society. So now also the, the business and the, the investors, they are moving more also, not only to have this economic benefit, but also they are looking into the social and they're looking into the ecological. So they, they are looking at these the, the three, the three things that are important. So MPAs uh, provide also that social and and, and natural. Um, then here uh, we have more about why invest in NPS. So actually, yeah, now uh, there is sufficient funding for effective management. So the thing, uh, the examples that we have been talking, uh, so most of the funds, they, they come from public funding. We also have talked about a, a bit about private funding. 
but I think the important thing uh, that we should think about is to diversify these, these incomes that we have. So try to get also from public, from private, so from different sources, because if one stops, then, for example, with the COVID, with the pandemic, no, there are some uh, MPAs that they are self-sustainable. Uh, for example, uh, Chagos Marine Protected Area. Uh, that one is it's an example of a self-sustainable marine protected area from the tourism. And then if, uh, if a pandemic comes and there is no more tourism, then how this MPA can be self-sustained. So then we need to find different sources of income, but something happens, no? Um, then during the... Ten, during the past 10 years, investors are seeking now more positive social and environmental returns. So they, they, as I say, they are looking more for social and environmental um, to, to invest. And then uh, this has allowed the improvement of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial approaches to management of MPAs. So now they are developing a lot of so business between the, so in the MPAs with the different sectors. So all this yeah, has a lot of potential now. In, this is an example for the Artifes del Sudeste in Dominican Republic. So here they have created the Blue Finance Collaborative Management Model, um, which they have been working in several countries already with this. Um, and then, yeah, they have been doing this, this model with, the, with this marine protected area. It's, um, yeah, big uh, coral reef um, ecosystem. And um, basically, they have um, they have this non-profit. Okay, they have done it through non-profit, the creation of non-profit, which they call a special purpose entity. So this is just an example that we can you know we can follow if you look for the blue blue finance. Um, so here are the important things. Um, yeah, so uh, for enforcement carried out by the NPA staff. But there is hard enforcement by the regulation agencies, incentives also for self-enforcement by fishers uh, and the tourism industry. So this is mainly also has a lot of tourism you know, in, the, in, the, in, in the model. They have the income mainly by the tourists. Uh, so here we have the revenue systems generated by the visitor fees that they do tourism activities. And then the impact invest, uh, investors, they, so they they have a you know a part of this no a part of this, so this is the returns no they have some returns um, depending on the market size or how many tourists they go to the marine protected area. Uh, but there is a risk as I said before here there is a risk because the tourism cycles no if they are and also there could be a risk because of there is no, no proper management or there are some environmental risks that sometimes we cannot cope with them. And then uh, this part, I would like to discuss it a bit further. This is one of the last. Um, because there are some other revenue generation models, and I think it would be good to generate a bit of discussion of uh, which ones you think you can apply in your, in your marine protected area. For example, these blue carbon credits. Um, that we were talking before that there are some projects in the Mediterranean um, like in, uh, I know, I know one, one in France, in Calanque, and, and in south of Spain. I don't know about more about this, but they are, what they are doing is to put in these ecological buoys uh, in an area where there is Posidonia or there is seagrass meadows, and then the companies they pay for for this for this project for the maintenance and for putting the buoys there. Um, so then they get these uh, blue carbon credits uh, from this because they are they, the Posidonia absorbs the the CO2 as we know. So then they can make a conversion of how much Posidonia you are cons you are preserving, like they do with the mangroves and with the forests, etc. So that could be also a source of income. Then natural solutions, biodiversity of such credits, compensation to MPAs to damage, for example, to damage coral reefs. I know they have been going on some projects on that. And, uh, and then from users' fees, uh, from more and more fees also, there's another option. Um, so yeah, maybe you have some other ideas. They are, they are not here. Um, it can be a prize for the first one who raised the hand. <laughs> for the, the most original idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, have you applied any of this, or any of these uh, revenue generation models? Uh, Sorry, they I they go here. Yeah, <laughs> we need some thinking. Yeah, I know, I know. We this is the last one actually. So just a few, and we can we can think about it and also you know for tomorrow this. You want to add something too? I think, yeah, I think probably. Uh, I mean, it, it is important. And tomorrow you're going to be putting together an actual funding proposal, if you like, a marketing brief. So it will be quite good to think overnight what ways are we raising money already, what opportunities have we got for our MPAs, because you might want to refer to those in the marketing brief tomorrow. And we can have more discussion about it in the course of compiling the brief. Do you want? Can I say something about yes. Very fast. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Very fast. Very fast. Yeah. No, this is to let you go because uh, they are not satisfied. The trainers are not satisfied with this. So, <clears throat> my knowledge of the environmental laws, at least in North Africa, uh, compensation uh, of uh, pollutant pay is there in the laws. However, um, unfortunately, it's either the law is very long, uh, is very old or the amount of compensation is not uh, equitable to the current value of the ecosystem. So that's why, especially when it comes to oil spills that um, may damage uh, coastal areas or uh, seagrass beds or anything else, in many times in Libya, for example, we didn't want it as a Ministry of Environment to take the, the case to the, to the court because it's in favor of the oil company to take it in court because they know the law is weak and they will pay very minimal. So <clears throat> what we do is, and I was uh, told by Mohammed, my colleague last night about this in, a, in a previous years. Uh, so the guy responsible of the oil spill uh, response team uh, started to negotiate with the company saying that this damage might reach to, say, 5,000, uh, 500,000 uh, uh, Libyan dinners, for example. So we are asking you for 1, 000, uh, 150,000, 100, for example, because it's much better than the 10,000 that they will pay in the court. So in that case, the biodiversity offset credits of compensation from uh, uh, oil spill, for example, is one of the critical things that needs to be revisited in the law. And uh, the problem is how to show the legal people who are responsible, or even the parliaments, that the value that you are putting on the ecosystems today in millions or trillions of dollars to people who are not biologists or not appreciating that much. So it's a big gap between the decision makers who are the MPs in this case and the Minister of Environment. So it's still we are still talking the language, but in two different uh, places, and uh, it's not it's not easy to to apply. Uh, it is just a case study. Thank you very much for coming today, and I leave the last word for the trainers. Okay, well, well, Patty finds a prize. I just want to remind the Palm Island team that they've forgotten they could have responded because you have some entrance fees to go into the park. But you can be thinking about that tomorrow, so. <laughs> you are asleep. Remind these guys to do the presentation. Yes, that was good. Too. Yeah, and, and, then, and then I have something to say. Oh, um, okay, okay. First of all, uh, quick reminder to this team: you've got work to do tonight because you're doing the feedback on today, the review of today. Okay. <laughs> we don't want faces what? like yeah. that. <laughs> you're going to make it very exciting and dynamic. Yeah. And Emna, now uh, just to ask you to bring your computers tomorrow.
as um, even if you have more uh, many computers around the table this is uh, this is okay it will be fine uh, we're going to need them especially in the morning and in the afternoon so don't forget yeah everybody heard that bring your computer tomorrow Okay. okay. Thank you very much for today. I know it was a hard day. Uh, brain. <laughs> Have a nice evening. Ten seconds. You could borrow.